My name is Hank, and I'm a fire lookout in a remote part of Montana. It was July 2018, one of those unbearably hot summer days when the sun scorched the earth and the air felt dry as parchment. I maintained a secret dislike for my job but couldn't complain much in these serene woods away from the hustle and bustle of city life. In this line of work, you'd expect to encounter some odd or unnerving situations. However, nothing before or since has come close to what I experienced that one fateful day. Sitting in my lookout tower, I struck up a conversation with Greg another lookout located about two miles east of me. As Greg and I chatted away, we shared stories about odd occurrences and unexplained happenings in the woods. He told a hilarious joke mid-conversation that I couldn't help but remember even now. Why don't some couples go to the gym? Because some relationships don't work out. He let out an exaggerated snort that seemed contagious. It had me laughing far longer than necessary. Eventually, we moved on to stories about grisly encounters and unusual sightings, things that make you avoid wandering around after dark. As our conversation drew to an end, Greg mentioned something peculiar from earlier that day. He'd seen something large, hairy, and incredibly quick moving through the forest nearby his station. Although we both dismissed it as just another bear sighting, little did we know what awaited us. The next couple of weeks were uneventful until one sweltering afternoon when I received a crackling transmission over my radio from Sarah, an emergency dial operator for my region. Hank, she said urgently, we've got someone injured near your sector. Can you go assist? Seems like they've encountered something malicious. Lots of blood. I felt jittery at the thought, but reluctantly agreed to help. Leaving my post, I jogged toward the coordinates Sarah had given just as the last rays of the setting sun cast an orange glow amid the trees. Fully aware that a gruesome discovery awaits me, I searched and found a tree marked with blood. My heart raced as I followed the trail it formed. As I moved closer to the location, I stumbled upon what had become a massacre, torn and shredded clothes, mangled limbs, and bits of flesh scattered everywhere like confetti during a sick revelry. This sight unnerved me in ways I never thought possible. My breathing quickened as I treaded carefully among the carnage. I attempted to radio Sarah back but couldn't find the words or composure. After what felt like centuries, I mustered the courage to contact her and report my grisly discovery. Sarah, listen, this is more than an accident. We need help out here, I uttered falteringly. While waiting for the reinforcements to arrive, I heard a rustle nearby in the woods that amplified my anxiety. It was something big and vicious sounding. As beads of sweat dripped down my forehead, my peripheral vision caught something horrifying, a dark figure moving fluidly among the foliage that surrounded us, nearly blending in effortlessly. Adrenaline took over as fear coursed through every vein in my body at the sight of this grotesque beast-like creature. It appeared to be part animal, part human, with elongated limbs covered in matted fur that did little to disguise its raw strength or bloodlust. Terror-stricken by the seemingly unknown entity stalking me from afar, I decided it would be best not to provoke it if there was any hope of making out alive. With bated breath and trembling hands clutching my firearm tightly for protection, any faith in emerging and scathed seemed buried under mounting dread. Frozen stiff with fear as this monstrosity advanced through the darkness with its dead eyes locked on me, I suddenly wondered if this was the end for me. Would I suffer the same fate as the unfortunate soul reduced to lifeless strips of flesh? As the creature moved closer, my survival instincts kicked in, and I knew that running was my only chance. In the blink of an eye, 
I turned and started sprinting, navigating through the trees while tripping over roots and branches. My legs begged for mercy, but there was no time to stop. Help! Anyone, help me! I shouted into my radio as the creature's growls gained on me. I'm sending reinforcements. Hang on, Sarah replied, her voice filled with worry. As I ran, other officers arrived on the scene to assist. They were startled by the butchered remains and chaos that lay before them. The ferocious creature lunged from cover to attack another officer, its sharp claws slashing through the officer's protective vest-like paper. The officer fell to the ground, writhing in agony. I heard Sarah scream into the radio, Officer down! We need backup now! The monster continued its gruesome rampage, leaving a trail of destruction wherever it went. Another officer attempted to shoot it down but missed. Several rounds struck trees or sailed harmlessly past their target. The creature snarled menacingly at him before bounding towards him with unnatural speed. With one powerful swipe of its massive arm, it sent him flying through the air. In my frantic attempt to escape its deadly clutches, I somehow found myself cornered at a cliff's edge. There was no way back. The only way forward was down into the abyss below. Glancing at the radio beside me and then at the enraged beast charging towards me with bloodlust in its eyes, I had no other choice. I'm sorry, I muttered as I launched myself off the cliff edge. As I plummeted towards the jagged rocks beneath me, memories of my fellow officers flashed through my mind. Their camaraderie and dedication would never be forgotten. A rescue team found me the following day, battered and bruised from the fall. Luckily, I landed in a shallow part of the river below, lessening the impact and saving my life. Upon recovery, local authorities initiated a hunt for the menacing creature that plagued their quiet town. They scoured the woods and interrogated locals, desperate to find any information that could lead them to the beast responsible. Surprisingly, some spoke of an old legend passed down through generations, a cryptid that lived in the forest, known as the Shadow Beast. However, those were mere stories, and no one had ever encountered such a creature before now. No traces of it were found during the search. In time, the remaining victims' families mourned their slain loved ones. Grace under grief was all they could muster. Those ripped away from us will never be replaced, nor will they be forgotten by those who knew them best. Although life eventually resumed its normal pace, one nagging question would forever linger in our minds. Where did this murderous monster come from? How many more lurked in shadows beyond those now tainted woods? No one knows if it's still out there or if we'll ever find answers to quell our fears entirely. For now, I live each day with a cautious awareness of the dangers lurking unseen around us all too aware of what the future might hold. My name is Stanley Kowalski, and I'm a park ranger at a little-known national park in the United States. Clichés and ghost stories don't interest me, but uncovering mysteries always captured my imagination. Nothing out of the ordinary ever occurred until the day I found myself in the strangest and most terrifying situation you could imagine. Surrounded by thick trees and lush vegetation, I conducted my daily patrol through the vast wilderness. My co-workers and I had been tracking unusual activity near an abandoned logging site. After investigating, we found remnants of old makeshift campsites, leading us to believe that we were dealing with trespassers or poachers. As I moved deeper into the forest, I stumbled upon what seemed to be human remains scattered around a peculiar altar made from rocks, 
twigs and branches. Feeling nauseous at the sight and smell of blood mingling with the dirt and leaves underfoot, my pulse quickening as fear began to take hold. My radio crackled to life as my partner checked in on me. Stanley, any updates on your location? Jane asked. I, I found something disturbing over here. I stuttered as dread clawed its way up my throat. We might want to call in some backup. Copy that, stay where you are, she responded quickly. I'm only a few minutes out. In those unsettling moments waiting for Jane, I mulled over what could have caused such unspeakable carnage. My gut told me it wasn't just your average criminal activity. There had to be something more sinister lurking behind the shadows of this grim discovery. Jane arrived breathless and horrified at the sight before her. She gasped for air after running all the way towards me, holding herself together as professional composure washed over her face. We need to secure this area immediately, she commanded through gritted teeth. While we swiftly cordoned off the location, an eerie, bone-chilling sound echoed through the trees. It was a low rattling noise. The closer it came, the more my instincts told me to flee. But as park rangers, we had a duty to protect this land and its people, so we stood our ground. The hellish sound materialized into a monstrous creature emerging from the dense undergrowth. This beast towered over us, its black and skeletal frame cloaked in an aura of malice. Its unnatural head resembled that of a deer or elk skull, with massive twisted antlers that scraped the sky as it paced forward. Dumbfounded at the sinister behemoth now stalking towards us, Jane reacted first, drawing her firearm with shaking hands. The resounding report of her gunfire sent tremors of panic rippling through me. To our horror, bullets merely glanced off its thick hide without causing any damage. It screeched, a horrifying blend of anguish and wrath erupting from its skull-like visage before charging at us with unholy speed. We ran without hesitation, desperately vaulting over fallen trees and undergrowth while it pursued relentlessly. Our hearts on the verge of bursting from our chests, we scrambled in different directions to throw it off our scent, but nothing seemed to deter its determination to catch us. The cacophony of breaking branches filled the air as the chase ensued. In the heat of the moment, knowing we couldn't escape this horrifying creature on our own, I fumbled for the radio fastened to my belt and managed to call in for backup. My voice was trembling as I urgently relayed our dire situation to our fellow park rangers. The radio operator's response came back terse and crackling with static. Hang tight and try to avoid confrontation. We're sending help your way. Jane and I soon found ourselves on opposite sides of a small clearing. The monster stomped through the trees, shaking the earth beneath it as its huge twisted antlers gored into the bark. Its eyes blazed with unadulterated malice, leaving no doubt that it intended to inflict immense pain upon us. Glancing around desperately for an escape route, I noticed a narrow, muddy riverbank in the distance. I motioned towards it, and Jane's eyes followed my gaze. We both knew water might be our only chance at survival since creatures like this are usually inept swimmers due to their size. We sprinted toward the riverbank, splashing through mud and narrowly dodging vines. As we plunged into the frigid waves, I could feel the tremendous force of the beast in pursuit. The water slowed our movements making it even more difficult to gain ground. Moments later, an unsettling silence enveloped us, a brief respite from the nightmare. I peered over my shoulder to see if the behemoth had halted at all, only to catch sight of its ghastly shadow looming above us. Before it could pounce, a hail of gunfire erupted from behind me, 
our fellow park rangers had arrived just in time. Bullets tore through the air while bright red flares illuminated the scene. The monster hesitated for a moment, as though processing these formidable new foes before letting out another blood-curdling screech and retreating back into the woods. Come on! A grizzled park ranger bellowed, pulling Jane and me to our feet. Head back towards base, the captain will want to hear about this. As we made our way to safety, occasionally glancing over our shoulders to ensure the creature was no longer in pursuit, it dawned on me how utterly unprepared we had been for an encounter like this. The fact that such an abomination could reside in these forests sent a chill down my spine. Once we safely reached headquarters, fellow park rangers immediately rushed out of the main building to tend to us. With soaked clothes and trembling hands, I recounted our traumatic experience between ragged breaths, how bullets bounced off the creature's hide, its menacing eyes and the overwhelming feeling of hopelessness. The captain's brows furrowed when he heard what transpired. The local wildlife experts will need to be notified, he said firmly. In the meantime, we need to set up a perimeter, secure that entire area, and inform local residents about the danger. A few days later, with new protocols in place and alerts issued for hikers and campers alike, life in the park seemed safer, albeit heavier knowing that such a formidable predator lurked in proximity. Though having defended ourselves valiantly during the pursuit, Jane was injured and out of commission. Meanwhile, I still felt the weight of guilt over my former colleague Dave who wasn't as fortunate. Each step I now took within those once peaceful woods would be forever tainted by bloodshed and horror. While my primary goal would always be protecting park visitors and wildlife alike, this newfound knowledge about such monstrous creatures added an entirely new and harrowing responsibility to our roles as park rangers. I was driving home after a long day at work when it happened. October 2017, it was almost midnight, and my eyelids were heavier than ever. I've always prided myself on being an extraordinarily cautious driver, but tonight my focus wavered as exhaustion took hold. My car rumbled along the desolate back roads of Alabama when I noticed something out out of the corner of my eye. Scattered bones littered the quiet roadside. Glancing at them briefly, I shuddered and tried to put them out of my mind with a cynical chuckle. These coyotes are into some dark humor. I muttered to myself, attempting to make light of the situation. But my laughter was empty. As I drove down the twisted road through the dense trees, I came upon a fallen tree branch obstructing any further movement. Cursing under my breath, I parked and reluctantly stepped out of my car to clear it away. I grabbed the branch and heaved it aside, glancing towards the woods as I did so. In the distance, I could see several small figures standing between the trees. Their eyes appeared pitch black like miniature voids that swallowed all light. I tried to ignore them, despite the fear churning in the pit of my stomach. They might have been just a group of local children trying to scare strangers, but their malevolent gaze was something else entirely. It felt as though they were communicating some unspoken threat directly into my mind. Hands shaking, I climbed back into my car and sped away from that unsettling scene. As my tires screeched against the pavement in haste to get away, I felt a faint tapping on my window. One of those children had latched onto my car. In the half-lit glow of my dashboard lights, I observed their tiny hands frantically scratching at the glass, black eyes staring soullessly into mine. Desperation set in as I desperately swerved 
hitting the brakes hard in an attempt to dislodge my unwelcome passenger. Gripping the steering wheel, I thought of everything dear to me, my wife, my children, and all the unfulfilled dreams awaiting me back home. The child ceased its relentless scratching, but its implacable glare never wavered. Instead, it only intensified. Realization washed over me there was more than one of them. From all directions they were closing in, their black eyes fixed upon me with razor-sharp focus. As their grip tightened around my vehicle, the engine stalled. Panic-stricken, I reached for my cell phone and managed to dial 911, praying to God that someone would come to my aid. Can you hear that too? I yelled into the phone when the operator picked up. There are these children there trying to get in. The operator's response was calm but laced with disbelief. Please stay where you are, sir. We're dispatching someone to your location immediately. My frenzied gaze darted around inside the car as I locked every possible entrance. The children circled it like predators stalking their prey, their black eyes devoid of any humanity. Sweat dripped from my forehead as I looked over at the revolver stashed beneath the driver's seat. It was a relic from better days when it had simply been a confidence booster during long road trips through much safer terrain than now. Desperately calculating how many rounds would be needed for this wild bunch surrounding me, I drew a grim conclusion there simply weren't enough bullets for each one of them. Screaming erupted from all directions as they began shattering my car's windows with what seemed like otherworldly strength. Glass shards exploded like fireworks throughout the small space. Heart pounding so hard it threatened to burst, I reached for the door handle just as their cold, shriveled fingers clawed at my ankle. Fighting back with every ounce of strength remaining, I kicked wildly, trying to break free from their tightened grip. With the children closing in, I managed to pry my ankle free from their grasp and swung open the car door. As I stumbled out of the vehicle, I could hear police sirens in the distance getting closer by the second. My heart soared with hope, but I knew I had to stay focused on the present or else risk becoming a victim of these menacing creatures. Scrambling to my feet, I ran towards a nearby fence lining a thick forest. The wind howled through the trees as the branches whipped against my face while I struggled to catch my breath and keep moving forward. Behind me, the sounds of glass shattering further echoed throughout the night as the children rampaged through my car. Their eerie laughter sent chills down my spine as they continued their pursuit. As I reached the heart of the woods, my pace slowed down, feeling exhausted and disoriented. The tree branches seemed to reach out for me, snatching at my clothes and scraping across my skin. The children's footsteps grew louder as they closed in on me with unnerving speed. Suddenly, bright headlights cut through the darkness illuminating the forest around me. A police cruiser emerged from between the trees, barreling towards us and skidding to a halt just inches away from where I stood. I waved frantically at the officer inside before turning to face the terrifying mob of black-eyed children following me. Their figures froze momentarily at the sight of law enforcement presence before they began retreating into shadows as if mere light was their weakness. The officer stepped out of his vehicle with gun drawn, concern etched onto his face as he assessed the situation. Glancing back at where the children had vanished without any traces left behind, he lowered his weapon and looked at me with a mix of sympathy and disbelief. Before we could exchange any words, more police cruisers arrived at the scene along with an ambulance. They quickly assessed my injuries, and I was loaded into the ambulance for further treatment and questioning. During the ride to the hospital, I repeatedly told my story to disbelieving officers and medical personnel. 
My recounting of the events did little to convince anyone, except for a single officer who had recognized my description of the black-eyed children. While I never encountered those black-eyed children again, their haunting presence would continue to lurk in the back of my mind, a grim reminder of that fateful night. Though many people had doubted my story and my credibility, that one understanding officer gave me comfort in knowing that I was not alone in witnessing these terrifying beings. In the days that followed, the shattered remains of my car served as a testament to the chaotic attack I endured. The memory of my wife and children's worried faces as they visited me in the hospital reinforced just how much was at stake when those evil creatures targeted me. As time went on, life gradually returned to normal. I often offered gratitude for having escaped that moment with my life intact, even if it meant living with an unshakable sense of dread. Yet throughout all this, I held on to one hope, that somehow those menacing black-eyed children were gone for good, and no one else would have to endure their horrifying presence again. It was an odd month in October 2018 when it happened, an incident that changed my perspective on my work as a cop. People often tell me my sense of humor is impeccable, but at the time, I could hardly laugh at anything. My duty had carried me to a small real-life town called Blackwood, nestled in the northeastern corner of Ohio. It started with an unsettling pattern of disappearances and seemingly random acts of violence. The local police department was completely mystified by the strange incidents that were happening around them. Some tried to rationalize it as a new crime wave or gang-related violence, but nothing added up. During one particularly disturbing case and quite unique, I must say we found an unfortunate man's fingers carefully sliced off and lined up across his blood-soaked kitchen counter like ghastly finger sandwiches. Meanwhile, he lay unconscious on the floor, covered in blood and groaning in pain. It was haunting, as though someone deliberately left calling cards behind for us to find. For days, our team pored over case files, photographs, and witness statements. One evening while going through the reports from the beginning again, piecing together a puzzle that seemed impossible to solve, I realized how much coffee I'd consumed that day and excused myself to visit the restroom. As I washed my hands in the dimly lit bathroom, staring into the cracked mirror above the sink thinking about this entire ordeal we were facing, I heard a door creak open ever so slightly behind me. Who's there? I called out with a nervous chuckle. No reply came, so I shrugged it off as an odd coincidence that might have been caused by the wind blowing through an open window. But when another slow creak echoed through the room as the door once again moved slightly from its original position, this time closing I felt an uneasy chill wash over me. I returned to the station's common area, unsettled but ready to focus on the matter at hand. That's when the dispatcher's voice crackled over the radio, informing us of yet another victim discovered in an abandoned warehouse on the outskirts of town. We rushed to the macabre crime scene, one unlike any I'd come across before. The victim was hanging from the rafters by a length of barbed wire, their face unrecognizable due to the missing skin, which disturbingly had been neatly folded and laid out on a heavy table nearby. It was as if we stumbled into the lair of a sadistic artist, an odd exhibition sending shivers down my spine. As my colleagues started photographing and documenting this horrendous space, I noticed something peculiar— Dust collected around the corners of the room as if it hadn't been disturbed yet. A sudden unexpected creak above me caused everyone to stop in their tracks. Frozen with dread, we braced ourselves for what might follow, 
but nothing came. Hesitantly, I glanced upward to see an uninviting shadow creeping around rafters only for it to vanish upon closer inspection. Within moments, chaos erupted in that warehouse. Gunshots rang out, crashing furniture and scattered debris littered our surroundings as our team fought against an invisible foe. The villain had ambushed us cold, calculating, cleverly avoiding our bullets. In the chaos and confusion, I noticed my colleagues dropping one by one, succumbing to the unknown attacker. I grasped at any potential cover and frantically scrambled behind a large stack of crates, hoping that it might offer some protection from the relentless assault. The team was in disarray, unable to pinpoint the assailant's position or even discern their appearance. The only traits we could define were that they were incredibly fast, effortlessly outpacing any attempt we made to flank or engage them and extremely well prepared, knowing exactly when and where to strike. My radio came alive with sporadic snippets of terrified communication as fellow officers shouted desperately for help, each time interrupted by the bone-chilling sound of another person being taken down. Recognizing the futility in trying to locate our adversary by firing blindly, I pressed the transmit button and urged everyone to regroup in a designated safe zone. I'd hoped that by consolidating our strength in numbers, we'd have a better chance at observing the enemy as they attempted further sabotage. Unfortunately, though several officers managed to retreat successfully, many others had already become casualties of this invisible foe. As I crouched there in terror, Hearing only distant screams and piercing sounds of metal slicing through flesh, I made a painful decision. I needed to escape this madness if there was ever any hope of finding help and bringing it back to save my remaining comrades. Once again relying on sheer instinct rather than rational thought, I forced my legs into motion and sprinted toward what little light filtered through dusty windows on the far side of the warehouse. Miraculously managing to avoid detection, or perhaps choosing not to be intercepted, I burst out into the open air and gulped desperately for breath. Fumbling with trembling hands for the radio once more, I relayed my position and pleaded for immediate backup. My heart pounding wildly against my ribcage in dread of what would follow, I scrambled for cover and tried to remain as hidden and silent as possible praying that the attacker wouldn't find me before help arrived. With every agonizing second that passed, my mind raced between guilt over leaving my team behind and fear of what fate awaited them at the hands of this ruthless and cunning enemy. The distorted visages of our first victim and the surrounding carnage played out like a nightmarish slideshow in my memory haunting me even more than the fact that I was unable to put an end to it. I don't know how long I crouched there, body tensed and limbs aching, but eventually distant sirens pierced my reverie. Relief washed over me, intermingling with despair for those we'd lost, yet there was still one unyielding question gnawing away at my sanity. Who or what had orchestrated this brutal attack on us? The backup units arrived with urgent haste, rapidly securing the perimeter while entering the warehouse to stem any further bloodshed. I took a deep breath, braced myself for what I would see beyond those walls again and knew that it was now my responsibility to ensure this attacker's capture before they inflicted more pain and terror on anyone else. Upon entering the warehouse with newfound determination and resolve hardening every step, I observed immediately that conflict had ceased within. All lay terrifyingly still, save for the unsettling sight of countless officers cradling the fallen victims left behind in my frantic flight. The attacker had somehow slipped through our grasp once more, though it was only a matter of time before they resurfaced to kill again. This time, we would be prepared. 
The memory of our fallen comrades would fuel our determination to hunt down this deadly adversary tirelessly. Whoever they were, we'd make them pay dearly for their gruesome actions today. My name is Jasper, and the thing about living in a secluded cabin in the woods is that you forge a strange friendship with silence. This peculiar bond became apparent after I moved into the Elkhorn Ridge area, where I found solace in the whispers of the wind and solace in nature's serenade. A few months ago, I received a call from my old buddy Marcus. He said he would be visiting me next weekend and thought it might be nice to catch up after all those years. Excited for his visit, I make sure everything is perfect at the cabin and decide to tidy up the trails around my property. While working along one of the trails, I came across something strange sticking out of the ground, a human bone. The sight of that single bone left me feeling uneasy, but it was just one piece it could have come from anywhere, right? Despite being unnerved, I shrugged it off as nothing more than an isolated incident. Marcus arrived the following Friday, and we spent that evening catching up. He picked up on my edgy demeanor and prodded me about what was troubling me. Being a good friend, I confided in him about finding that human bone out on those trails near my cabin. Little did we know that sharing this information would become our biggest regret. The next morning, determined to dispel any fears, we decided to hike deeper into the woods to find logical explanations for our discovery. The sun shone through the foliage above us as we walked through nature's beauty. After several hours, however, as dusk took hold of that once-lit landscape, we came across another eerie sight. Several trees were disfigured with long claws gouged deep into their bark in an erratic pattern. It didn't resemble any wildlife marks we had seen before. These hints of devastation plagued our thoughts and caused our anxiety to peak ever so slightly. The wind whistled through the trees, stirring apprehension in our hearts. Our eyes met and Marcus suggested we head back to the safety of my cabin before total darkness consumed the woods. As apprehensive as we were, we agreed it was for the best and started trekking back towards home. Then, suddenly, an overwhelming stench of decay filled our nostrils. Tense and alarmed, we pressed on. Not too far from the disturbing odor source, we found a grotesque creature hunched over a lifeless body. The creature was covered in dark thick fur, with elongated limbs that ended in fearsome claws that clung to the decomposing body. As if aware of our presence, the creature lifted its head revealing a grotesque maw filled with razor-sharp teeth and began to growl. But this nightmare come to life didn't end there. This monstrous being's eyes were nothing more than bottomless black pools, void of any empathy or understanding. Marcus grabbed a fallen branch nearby to try and defend us while I desperately tried to dial for help on my phone. No signal reached our remote location. The creature's growling intensified while my fingers shook and failed to make contact with anyone outside this forested purgatory. As the creature snarled, Marcus and I knew that we needed to escape. The fallen branch in Marcus' hands would do little to protect us from this monstrous beast. With terrified glances at one another, we turned and began sprinting back through the forest, desperate to put as much distance between us and the creature as possible. Our footsteps pounded against the earth, echoing through the once tranquil woods. It wasn't long before we heard the pounding of heavy limbs chasing after us. Our hearts raced as fast as our legs did, forcing every ounce of energy into outrunning this nightmare. However, the further we ran, the more disoriented we became. We had been hiking all day, and our sense of direction had been lost along with any remaining daylight. We couldn't call for help, 
there was no signal in these woods, and there was no logic or reason behind this horrific situation. As Marcus and I continued running, hoping to rediscover a familiar path back to my cabin, a piercing scream echoed through the trees. I glanced back just in time to see Marcus trip on a hidden tree root, falling to the ground with a pained cry. I hesitated for a moment before realizing that there was no way I could save him. Panicking and heartbroken, I continued running for my life while listening to his screams grow fainter behind me. I kept running until my legs gave out beneath me, collapsing onto the cold forest floor. Exhausted and defeated, I lay there for a moment before gathering my thoughts. It finally occurred to me that we had left marks in several areas while hiking earlier that day, clawed trees from our investigation near my cabin. Using the last remaining light provided by the moon's glow filtering through the trees above me, I staggered back along our original route, focusing on finding those distinctive markings to lead me home. It took several agonizing hours, but eventually, I happened upon the first clawed tree we had discovered earlier that day. With a newfound surge of hope and determination, I continued following our trail back to my cabin. As I finally stumbled through the door of my cabin, I collapsed onto the floor, overwhelmed not only by exhaustion but by the grief brought on by Marcus' death. He had been my friend and confidant, sharing an interest in nature and adventure. Now he was gone. Overwhelmed with sorrow and desperate for help, I grabbed my phone and found that it now had a signal. I hastily dialed the nearest ranger station, gasping out quick details about what had happened. The operator on the line listened intently before promising to send help immediately. With a heavy heart, I locked all the doors and windows of my cabin and carefully barricaded myself in until help arrived. Falling into an uneasy sleep on the floor, any small noise threatened to awake me in a panic. The ensuing days saw local authorities examining the woods near my cabin and attempting to locate Marcus' remains, though they would share few details with me. Despite trying to explain our encounter with the vicious beast, they seemed reluctant to believe me fully, instead suggesting that a bear could have been responsible for the unusual disturbance. In their search for answers, they found no trace of Marcus or the creature we had encountered, leaving him among those forever lost in these treacherous woods, yet another victim in an unexplained tragedy. As time passed and I attempted to return to some semblance of normality within my secluded cabin home, I couldn't shake the memory of that gruesome day, nor could I forget every detail about that monstrous creature. Each time I ventured into the woods thereafter, whether alone or accompanied by others who sought answers about what happened to Marcus, there was always a lingering unease as if we were being watched from afar by something dark and sinister. I had lost my dear friend to a brutal fate, and with him went a part of my soul. However, I was determined to honor his memory by researching, documenting and protecting others from such horrors that I now knew existed. Marcus would not be forgotten, and I would ensure that his life and his tragic end would have meaning. One ordinary June 1994, I was driving my truck through a remote area of Minnesota, heading towards a delivery near the border of Iowa. My name's Derek Malloy, and trucking is my livelihood. It was a particularly long haul that evening, and I was doing my best to stay focused by listening to my favorite rock and roll station on the radio. As I traveled along the seemingly endless forested road, I noticed something peculiar on the side of the road up ahead. It was hard to see clearly in the dim evening light, but it appeared to be a car wreckage that must have occurred recently. 
Bits of shattered glass and twisted metal glittered amongst the lush greenery. As I pulled over and switched on my high beams to get a better look at the scene, I clicked on my CB radio and called out for help, but there was only static in response. With no cell phone reception out in these remote parts, it seemed like I'd have to handle whatever situation lay ahead alone for now. Stepping out of my truck cautiously, I approached the wreckage, feeling an unnerving chill as goosebumps prickled across my skin. The car appeared to have veered off the road rather violently. But who would abandon this mangled mess? There weren't any signs of people around. Suddenly, from a dense thicket nearby, a man emerged carrying what looked like car parts. Relieved to see someone who could perhaps provide context for what had occurred here, I quickly called out to him. Hey there! I waved as casually as possible under the circumstances. I just stumbled upon this mess. Are you okay? What happened? Rather than responding with words or showing any sign he'd heard me at all, the man dropped what he carried and strode toward me in an unnervingly predatory way. That's when panic set in as something about his demeanor suddenly seemed profoundly sinister. The moonlight revealed his features, making my blood run cold. He looked like a man who had seen far too much in life, with hollow eyes that reflected a disturbing darkness, and a gaunt face sporting a vicious grin. His ragged clothing hung loosely off his skeletal frame, giving him an aura of dereliction and danger. As he moved closer, I instinctively retreated towards my truck, intending to drive away and abandon the wreckage. Before I knew it, the man lunged at me with frantic speed. Terrified, I tried to fend him off with my fists, sending a wild punch into his face. This only seemed to invigorate the strangely emaciated figure more as he grabbed hold of my arm, wrenching it in an unnatural angle. My bones screamed in agony as I swung another fist into his side in sheer desperation. Reeling from the pain, I somehow managed to break free and ran back towards my truck with every ounce of strength left in me. The man continued to chase me as I fumbled for the keys in my pocket, praying that whatever dark intentions propelled him would not come to fruition tonight. As I scrambled into the cab and shoved the key into the ignition, I noticed something on his hands that had not been there before. They were coated in blood. My heart pounded even faster as I attempted to process what sickening things this deranged individual might have done before stumbling onto the scene. Turning on the engine, tires screeching against gravel as I pulled away as fast as possible from this nightmare scenario. But he was relentless. Even after putting distance between us, I could see him managing to keep pace with my speeding truck. As I sped away from the scene, I knew that I had no choice but to call for help. My hands were shaking so badly that it took me three attempts to dial 911. When the operator answered the phone, my voice trembled as I tried to explain what had just happened. An officer was dispatched to my location, but I knew I couldn't wait there for him. I had to keep moving to put as much distance between myself and that monstrous man as possible. So, I continued driving while listening to the soothing voice of the dispatcher on the other end of the line. As soon as the officer arrived at the location where I'd initially encountered the man, I pulled over and waited for him to find me. He approached cautiously when he spotted my truck and listened intently as I recounted all of the horrifying details of the encounter. He didn't seem skeptical or doubting. In fact, there seemed to be a level of understanding in his eyes, an unsettling familiarity with this type of situation. The officer was dark-haired and stocky and billed with a few days' stubble on his chin. 
We've had reports of a dangerous individual matching that description causing trouble in this area. He stated matter-of-factly. His calmness helped ease some of the panic churning inside me. Thank you for calling us when you did, he told me. We'll take over from here. With that, he instructed me to stay in my truck and drove back toward the site of my near-death experience. Uneasy and desperate for confirmation that it was safe now, I followed behind at a cautious distance. As we returned to where it had all begun, the wrecked car still smoldering, blue and red lights mixed with flickering shadows cast eerie patterns on our surroundings. The other officers swarmed around the car, searching for clues or any trace of that deranged man who'd attacked me. However, the man was nowhere to be found. The blood I noticed on his hands was evident in a fresh trail leading away from the scene, disappearing into the dense forest nearby. The search continued throughout the night, but to no avail. In the days that followed, a special task force was created to bring the man to justice. I remained in close contact with local law enforcement as the investigation continued. They assured me that I'd be kept apprised of any progress they made in capturing him. Sadly, no such progress occurred. Two more victims fell prey to this sadistic stranger, an elderly couple brutally beaten within their home, with bloody footprints leading away from the scene much like the ones I'd left behind that night. Their bodies were discovered days later when a neighbor noticed newspapers piling up outside their door and called for a welfare check. My chest tightened at the news of their deaths. Had it not been for my frantic retreat and desperate plea for help, it could have been my face on the evening news. Every time I drove alone on a dark road or heard an unexpected noise in my house, a shiver would run down my spine, a constant reminder of how close I came to marrying my own demise. Inevitably, life went on. That menacing grin and those hollow eyes faded to memory, replaced by ongoing sorrow for those who hadn't escaped that blood-soaked fate. The man remained at large, his motivations still baffling both investigators and residents alike, and his identity as unknown as his whereabouts. But despite all this uncertainty, one thing remained clear— we would never feel safe knowing he still roamed free among us. As years passed, people began getting on with their lives, joining neighborhood watch programs and equipping their homes with security systems. Always vigilant, never forgetting what had happened on that grisly night. And though the wounds of our town's past would never entirely heal, we stayed strong, bound together by the shared knowledge that surviving harrowing events had only made us more resilient in the face of pure evil. October 2019 I remember starting the new job as a fire lookout in the remote woods of Montana with great enthusiasm. My name is Landon McLeary, and I had moved there to leave everything behind in pursuit of tranquility and solace. A mundane existence surrounded by lush greenery, and the soothing sounds of nature seemed like paradise compared to tumultuous city life. However, that serenity wouldn't last forever. My work consisted of monitoring forested areas and looking out for signs of fires or illegal activity. Most days were spent in my tower, equipped with a radio for communication, a bed, a small kitchenette, and dusty maps to study the region. I felt completely and organically connected to nature, just as I desired. On one unassuming morning, about three months in, my colleague Gwen from a neighboring tower radioed me. Hey, Landon, she said with her country drawl. The strangest thing happened last night. I was checking on some possible campers when I found their site abandoned, 
Well, not exactly abandoned. The tents were shredded like confetti. Gwen paused before continuing. Their food was scattered everywhere, and there were tracks all around. It almost looked like some kind of giant eagle. She let out a chuckle to ease our unease. I don't find that very amusing. I grumbled and began to wonder what could have done that. Thoughts raced through my mind. What animal could have caused this? Over the following weeks, reports like Gwen seemed to multiply. Campers going missing or strange animal-like attacks. People reported seeing something monstrous lurking around campsites, only in the shadows. The entire community was fearful. Guides refused to lead hikes, even during daylight hours. Finally, one fateful autumn evening changed everything. There I was atop my watchtower gazing out at the wilderness when startling cries echoed through the forest. It sounded as if something were approaching with reckless abandon. In the distance, I could discern long, disorderly streaks of red scrawled across the trees. The air smelled sour and metallic. Moments later, a loud thud followed by a grotesque, wet sound emanated from below my tower. I whipped out my radio and urgently called Gwen. Gwen! Something's here at my tower! All I heard was silence on the other end. Panic set in as the tower shook violently under whatever monstrous presence had interrupted my formerly peaceful existence. The commotion abruptly ceased, and I slowly inched towards the window to find its source. The sight that greeted me was beyond comprehension. This stooping creature stood roughly nine feet tall upon hooved legs. Its ghostly wide eyes shimmered within a predatory snarl of elongated, jagged teeth. Claws like curved daggers extended from its gnarled hands. It resembled an aberrant cross between a human and some unknown nightmarish beast. I see what you mean now. I whispered into the radio, but still no response from Gwen came. My pulse pounded in my ears as I stared at the creature outside my window, desperately trying to stay perfectly still and silent. Suddenly the creature lunged from my tower's ladder, sending splinters of wood flying in all directions as it climbed rapidly towards me. With mere seconds left before it reached me, I jumped onto an adjoining branch high off the ground and then hurriedly scurried down the tree trunk. As soon as I reached the ground and sprinted into the dense foliage with desperation fueling every step, bellowing growls echoed through the forest around me. As luck would have it, I found an abandoned campground and quickly fashioned a makeshift barricade around me using tent fabric and fallen branches. While panic-stricken thoughts raced through my mind, a cacophony of anguished screams rang out from nearby. Agonizingly aware of the impending danger, I pressed my ear to the ground, listening for any signs of movement. The gut-wrenching reality of what I'd just encountered set in as chilling dread filled my veins. Did this creature exist beyond our world? A terrifying thought emerged. Could this beast also hunt us beyond the realm of imagination? My fingers trembled as I stumbled to grab the walkie-talkie, calling for help. Someone, please, there's a creature attacking my tower! My voice twisted in terror, revealing my urgency. The haunting silence persisted from Gwen's end. The creature tore through the canopy of branches with ease searching for any remnants of my scent. I could hear its shrill growls resonating like deathly drums through the forest. Time was running out. Clasping the radio in my hand, I sprinted into the thick vegetation parallel to a narrow river. A cautious glint of hope flickered within me. I hoped the water would mask my tracks and throw the creature off. Gwen's voice finally crackled to life through the walkie-talkie, her words choked with fear. Get away from there now! I'll send help! 
As I continued my escape, I could hear the heavy hoofed footsteps thudding closer and closer. The creature was right on my heels. Its razor-sharp claws nicked at the tall grass just inches from my feet as it lunged at me but fell short of making contact. Unable to comprehend this beast's motivation, all I knew was that it aimed to capture or kill me, maybe even both. My energy drained away as fatigue threatened to overtake me, but there was no option other than continuing to flee in terror. Several agonizing hours later, my muscles screamed with fatigue and fire, yet I heard distant sirens approaching. The weight of relief was heavy on my chest. Help had come at last. As rescue crews poured into the area with firearms and torches scanning through darkness, the creature disappeared deeper into the forest, a sight that etched itself onto everyone's memories as we held our breaths in anticipation. In the quiet stillness after its retreat, we captured a glimpse of what seemed like a mythical beast's retreat, a cryptid known by locals as the Jersey Devil. It was believed that no one had ever seen this creature and lived to tell the tale, but we had. The creature did not return, for now. Its chilling presence in the surrounding wilderness haunted all who found themselves within its territory. The once idyllic forest now held terrors within its depths, and we would never forget those who went missing or had suffered at the hands of this vile monster. Though I escaped unscathed, it claimed a few lives with its savage actions that night. As survivors, each of us carried a heavy burden, the memories of the victims and their fear-filled final moments. No one could explain how or why this wicked creature existed, but it was rooted deeply in our souls like a festering cancer that could strike again when least expected. Living each day with the threat of its return loomed overhead like an ominous cloud. From that day forward, I avoided the dark shadows beneath the towering trees, searching for even just an ounce of peace in my world turned upside down. We'll forever be scarred by our experiences, events that have connected us to each other like a cruel fate but etched into our minds as memories we'd give anything to erase. Our normal lives were robbed from us like an unfathomable thief in the night. That horrid creature lurking deep within those forests served as a constant reminder of fear. So we continue on, with hope for brighter days and longing for solace that may never come, the dreaded thought that this creature remains among us serving as both our curse and our legacy. I was never the superstitious type. I enjoyed living a quiet life in the Appalachian Mountains, away from the hustle and bustle of city life. The year was 2016 when I discovered that perhaps there were truths to the fear people had for what lurked in the wild. My solitary cabin awaited me to spend another day when all of this began. A normal evening ritual consisted of preparing dinner before it got too dark, drawing water from the nearby stream, and dry-checking my firearms, a .22 rifle and a shotgun. Making my way back home with water in tow, I stumbled over something half-buried in the earth. It appeared to be animal remains, but unlike anything I have ever encountered, the mutilated carcass was missing most of its limbs. Only stringy, grotesque tendrils were left protruding from where they should have been. Shaking off my unease, I hurried to finish preparing dinner. The more time passed, the more that disturbing discovery hung over me like a shadow at summer's close. Once nightfall descended over my isolated little haven, I dug sleeplessly into my meal. The emphatic crackling of branches snapped my head up, my hand instinctively reaching for the rifle next to me. Eyes peeled on what lay beyond, adrenaline rendered me silent as stone as an elongated figure came into view. 
The creature seemed a grotesque mockery of human form, towering with spider-like limbs sprouting from its body. Its head was a mass of twitching tendrils and I could feel each one probing at me like fingers. A sudden thud by my side jolted me out of terror-induced paralysis. Jeremy and Jacqueline, my two best friends who also lived off-grid about half-mile from mine, stumbled toward me with terror etched onto their faces. W.H. What was that thing? Jacqueline stammered out while they both stared at the creature. I don't know, I replied, equally shaken. Never seen anything like it before. No time for discussing, man! Jeremy cried, his voice breaking with terror. We need to get away from here now. Reluctantly agreeing, we hastily scrambled towards my cabin. As we approached, I noticed the door had been torn off its hinges. My blood ran cold as I entered to find my makeshift arsenal, shotgun shells and the rifle's ammunition, scattered across the floor. Quick, lock all entry points! My panicked but determined tone reached them as they nodded in agreement but before anyone could move, a screeching cry bellowed from outside. We need to leave! Now! Jacqueline cried out as we tumbled through sheets of darkness and dense brushwork that cloaked our home. Night's embrace was an obstacle course of treacherous terrors, slipping on zigs of mossy rocks, tripping over patterns of churned-up roots, and skidding through dampening undergrowth. Dodging between trees and climbing up ridges while every breath weighed in our lungs, the distant screams of fellow off-gridders echoed through the mountainside. Frederick, an experienced hunter who lived closest to me, had fired at the creature with his high-caliber hunting rifle, but it seemed nothing could slow it down. Fear became more tangible than any time prior in my life. Knowing that each tumble could mean falling right into a monstrous death pervaded every shifted step. My friends and I came to a clearing high above our homes, unsure of what to do next. The reality of having no backup plan when escaping such a supernatural thing dawned on us. What do we do? Everyone's gone, including our families. Jacqueline sobbed as she clung to her parents' memory with teary eyes. The weight of her words sunk into me. I looked at Jeremy and for a moment he smiled. I've always loved that band you introduced me to, Jack. Thanks. At least we're together, I added hopelessly, mustering final reserves of energy to bolster some semblance of solidarity. Suddenly, Jeremy's longing gaze snapped to the tree line just ahead. Almost immediately, we heard furious thrashing from behind. The staggering fear left us too petrified to scream, let alone move. We stood, frozen in fear as the creature charged towards us. It was a terrifying sight, enormous, covered in dark fur, and armed with razor-sharp claws. Its eyes gleamed with hunger and malice. Our instinct to survive took over, and we bolted. As we ran, I couldn't help but curse our decision to live this off-grid lifestyle, our naive belief that we were escaping from the world's dangers. Our breaths came in ragged gasps as we barely managed to stay ahead of the creature. Suddenly, Jacqueline tripped on a tree root hidden beneath the leaves. Jeremy and I instinctively lunged toward her just in time to pull her up as the monster's claws slashed through the air where her head had just been. As our desperation grew, we spotted something unusual, a strange out-of-place wooden staircase cutting into the mountainside. It seemed unnatural, but with no other option in sight, we made a break for it. As we scrambled up the steps, hoping for some reprieve from our relentless attacker, it struck again. This time its claws caught Jeremy's leg sending him crashing down onto the steps. The pain was evident on his face. He couldn't go on. Just leave me. He urged us through gritted teeth. 
I grabbed Jacqueline's hand and we reluctantly left Jeremy behind as he screamed in agony. Tears streamed down Jacqueline's face as we reached the top of the stairs. The creature paused to feast on its latest victim while keeping an eye on its next prey, stalking us from below. The staircase led us to a small clearing where an old cabin stood. We tried yelling for help. Surely, there must be someone nearby. But there was no answer. With no other course of action available, we barricaded ourselves inside the cabin and frantically searched for something, anything, that might give us a chance against the creature. As we searched, we stumbled upon an old, dusty book. Hidden within its pages, I discovered a description, along with a detailed drawing, of the beast that was hunting us. It was a Wendigo, a mythical creature said to have once been a human who had turned to cannibalism in a desperate bid for survival. According to the legends, consuming human flesh caused their transformation into this monstrous entity. We thought back to the missing people in our community, and everything began to make sickening sense. We realized that we needed something more than just our wits or brute strength if we were going to have any hope of escaping alive. We continued to search through the cabin and found an old hunting rifle hidden away. There weren't many rounds left, but maybe it would be enough if I could just hit the Wendigo in its vitals. As we braced ourselves for our final stand against this monster, I held Jacqueline close and vowed that if one of us had to die tonight, it wouldn't be her. The Wendigo circled the cabin, its guttural growls sending shivers down our spines. It finally rammed against the cabin door, breaking through our makeshift barricade with seemingly little effort. The battle was intense and gruesome, both Jacqueline and I were bloodied and exhausted, but somehow, Using every ounce of strength and courage we had left, we managed to fight off the Wendigo. As it lay dying on the cabin floor, we staggered outside. It was done. Both Jeremy and Frederick were avenged. When the shock of what happened subsided somewhat, I grabbed Jacqueline's hand and together we made our way back down the mysterious staircase. We would leave this place behind soon enough, but first... We needed to tell everyone what dangers lurked here in these quiet woods. Hopeful for a new beginning as we took each step, I looked up at the sky as the dawn began to break. The nightmare was over for now. Back in 1999, I was a part of an elite sub-squad that was made up of only Native Americans who hunted and eradicated mythical creatures from the face of our territory. My name's Isaac Littlehawk, and with my partners, Samantha Nightingale and Matt Brognero, we made sure that our people could live without fear from unnatural occurrences. We were stationed close to Point Pleasant in West Virginia. Our main mission revolved around a series of disturbances near an old, abandoned ammunition factory situated far from any residence. The locale had become something of a local legend. People claimed to have encountered something dark and terrifying there. Little Hawk! I heard Samantha call, chuckling. Can you get me some more rope for the rappelling gear? Matt here tied a Gordian not by accident. With a grin, I tossed her the requested ropes as Matt muttered under his breath. The glue that held our team together was the humor we shared. We geared up and headed out to that eerie factory under the cover of night. We found it more or less as we expected, dilapidated and crumbling. The moon's light struggled to make its way through the cloud cover above us, casting the menacing structure in monstrous shadows. As we crept toward our objective, tensions slithered like a serpent around our unit. We methodically cleared each room within the facility, but couldn't shake a feeling of unease. My intuition proved correct when Samantha cried out in warning, Something's here! 
I saw it in my peripheral vision. Stay sharp. Her eyes were wide with anxiety. Ears pricked and muscles tense, we prepared for an engagement with an unknown adversary. The oppressive silence seemed to close in on us like walls. After what felt like hours, I glimpsed movement ahead, a shape darting across our path before disappearing inside one of decrepit rooms. The apparition had been massive, coated in a black, shaggy hide. The clarity of the image vanished as soon as it appeared. Tactics, hissed Matt. Use the environment and don't let it get too close. We nodded in agreement as we moved forward cautiously. Moments later, we happened upon a grisly sight. One of our fellow agents lay on the ground, his body horribly mutilated. The gnawed remains of what appeared to be limbs were strewn around him. His face was twisted into a frozen scream of agony. My instinct was to call for backup, but signal interference from the nearby river rendered our radios worthless. Despair creeped into my chest, yet I steeled myself. There was no turning back now. We moved even more slowly, weapons trained on anything that might move. In our line of work, death was an ever-present reality. But facing it from such an impossibly powerful foe shook us to our core. Then we heard it. An abrupt crash shattered our fragile calm. A terrifying beast dropped before us, standing at least seven feet tall with matted hair and unnaturally large claws that dripped with malice. It snarled grotesquely, its eyes filled with nothing but hatred and hunger. The battle began with a swift fury that shook us to our cores. Samantha barely managed to sidestep the creature's razor-sharp claws slicing through the air in front of her. Matt fired several shots into the monster's hide but found only minimal success. The bullets failed to find purchase in its thick hide. I yelled at Samantha and Matt to fall back to our fallback position, a small clearing near an old shed we had passed earlier. As we sprinted, the beast pursued us relentlessly through the dense foliage, its snarls and roars echoing in our ears. We reached the clearing only to find that someone from the nearby town had come to investigate the commotion. It was a local wildlife expert named Henry who had heard about our team's search for a missing agent. We had a brief exchange of information, during which we agreed it was best for him to help us in dealing with this creature, considering he knew more about the local fauna. The nightmare continued as the beast tore into the clearing. Henry tossed me a tranquilizer gun he brought with him saying it might slow down or even incapacitate the creature. I took aim and fired a dart into its side as it lunged towards us once more. To my surprise, it took effect almost instantly, sending the creature stumbling sideways, giving us time to form a defensive line. Despite its slowing movement, the beast's persistent pursuit was unrelenting. We fought desperately against this seemingly unstoppable monster as it tried relentlessly to tear us apart. At last, after what felt like an eternity of fighting against nature's fury, a localized solution presented itself. Gasping for breath amidst our struggle, Henry told us about a close-by bear trap set up by locals who suspected a rogue bear was attacking their livestock. With this information in mind, we led the creature back towards this location by moving together slowly through the forest. Our luck persisted. We managed to lure it in the direction of the trap hidden beneath leaves and branches. As the creature took another step forward in pursuit of us, it finally triggered the trap. The metallic jaws snapped shut around one of its legs with devastating force. It let out an agonizing howl and collapsed onto its side. We cautiously approached the immobilized creature, our bodies coursing with adrenaline. I couldn't believe that we had managed to best this beast, even if temporarily. However, in our moment of relief, we quickly came to realize that it wasn't enough. 
Henry, concerned that more of these creatures could be lurking nearby, said we needed to report this to local authorities and research institutions. We agreed and took pictures of the creature with our phones. Despite their previous malfunction, they miraculously worked now that the beast was incapacitated. Whether it was a fluke or something more sinister, it only fueled our anxiety. We made our way back to town as fast as possible, contacting our superiors with an update on the situation. We shared the pictures of the creature and the details of our encounter at a local wildlife research center, where experts there identified it as a carnivorous cryptid named the River Claw, a creature known in local legends for its terrifying attacks on humans and animals alike. In the coming days, authorities were able to apprehend the beast safely due to its weakened state. The fallen agent's body was recovered and given a proper burial with all due honors. We mourned his loss deeply but felt solace knowing his death would likely prevent more tragedies and lead to better understanding of the cryptid species. In the end, despite not seeking answers or desiring confrontation, we were able to solve an old mystery that had haunted this area for decades. The overwhelming terror of confronting the River Claw became etched into our memories and left us ever vigilant for what might lurk in the shadows of both nature and human assumptions. I was sipping my black coffee in the mess hall. Recalling that time someone I knew made a joke about how it tasted worse than motor oil. My name is Callum Spicer, a Navy SEAL on a top-secret mission, and I never thought I'd find myself here at the infamous Alcatraz Island. My team and I were sent to investigate unusual activity reported in the underground tunnels beneath the notorious prison. Hey, Tom, mind passing that hot sauce? Samantha Winters our explosives expert asked, as if nothing unusual was happening. As we geared up for our night operation, I remember feeling skeptical about the whole situation. But work was work. I tightened the straps on my gear and checked my firearm. It couldn't hurt to be prepared for anything. Our journey took us through creepy passageways filled with shadows that seemed to move by themselves. We studied our surroundings with professional precision, marking each tunnel we explored as we went deeper into the belly of Alcatraz. You know why ghosts are bad liars? Jack Hayes asked as he walked beside me, scanning the darkness with his flashlight. Why? I replied in a whisper. Because you can see right through them. He chuckled softly and continued walking forward. In one dimly lit room, we stumbled upon a gruesome sight, a body mangled beyond recognition. That's when we knew this mission was no laughing matter. We radioed for backup but found ourselves unable to make contact. Something was interfering with our signals. We had no choice but to move forward, determined to uncover whatever malevolence awaited us. We continued cautiously as unexplained noises echoed around us. Footsteps followed us where none could have been. Raspy breaths grew louder in our ears. Metal scraped against metal like fingernails on a chalkboard. On later missions that succeeded this one, assuming there were any, I might recall this life-changing incident through the lens of newfound understanding. But at that moment, when the monster revealed itself, a sharpened grin, Something like a cross between a bear and a mantis, except far more terrible. It was believably and logically real. Its claws glinted in the dark, like serrated steel knives meant to maim and mutilate. Its eyes were orbs of green, pulsating with hunger as it gazed upon its prey. Without warning, the creature lunged at Jack, easily tearing him apart with claws that seemed to elongate with every swipe. The team retaliated. Gunfire echoed throughout the tunnels, but none of our bullets seemed to slow it down. Horrified, I shot my weapon continuously until all I heard were dull clicks. 
It was no use. The creature was right on top of me, its breath foul-smelling and hot against my face. Stop! Samantha yelled as she tossed a flash spang grenade at the last second, momentarily blinding the beast. With the creature momentarily stunned, Samantha and I took the opportunity to run. We dashed through the dimly lit corridors, not wanting to look back and see if the monstrosity was following us. Our earlier inability to call for help was still a concern, as there seemed to be no way for us to reach our team or summon reinforcements. As we ran through the labyrinth-like complex, we tried opening various doors with no success. They were locked or blocked from the other side. It was beginning to feel hopeless until one door finally gave way, revealing a small room that looked like it had been used as an office. Inside, we found a walkie-talkie that crackled to life as we picked it up. The interference seemed weaker here, enough for us to communicate with our command center. We need backup. There's a creature down here out of control and incredibly dangerous. Samantha screamed into the walkie-talkie, her voice a mixture of fear and urgency. No response came for a moment before it crackled again. Hold your position. Backup is on its way. We locked the door and used whatever we could find, desks, chairs, file cabinets, to barricade ourselves in. The creature didn't waste time. Soon enough, we could hear it just outside the door, scratching and clawing as it tried to break through. Samantha and I were cornered like prey in a cage. We both gripped our weapons tightly though they had proven ineffective before. There was nothing more we could do but hope that help would arrive in time. Minutes felt like hours as the creature attempted over and over again to break down the door. Finally, through heavy static over the walkie-talkie, we heard someone say that they had arrived at our location. The relief washed over me like a waterfall as I registered salvation might be near. However, like a predator scenting blood in the water, the creature responded to the noise as well. It let out a shriek of rage and violence, forcing the metal door to bend inward. Panicked, we desperately pushed against the barrier in an attempt to keep it at bay. The door exploded open, showering us in fragments as backup stormed into the room, just in time. The creature let out another roar before charging toward one of our new teammates. They quickly dispersed to avoid its claws and used various weapons, flamethrowers, blades, and high-powered rifles to assault the beast. As Samantha and I stood back, trying to comprehend what was happening, we watched helplessly as our rescuers fought the creature without any apparent luck. It seemed all but invincible. Gas! Use gas! Samantha shouted suddenly. She had noticed several canisters of a powerful sedative earlier in the room that were used to subdue aggressive specimens. Members of our team leaped into action grabbing canisters and improvising makeshift launchers for them using their equipment. In no time, gas flooded the area, enveloping the beast within it. The creature spasmed with each breath it took, its fury compounded with agitation as its limbs began to slow down from the sedative's effects. As it stumbled about, caught in an inescapable web of slumberous poison, one last push from a high-powered rifle sent it crashing down. Exhausted but alive, we surveyed our surroundings. We knew nothing of this nightmare's purpose or why it was here, our curiosity overshadowed by horror after witnessing its carnage firsthand. In that moment we swore never to forget our losses. Jack had been brave till the end and died fulfilling his duty. In the days following our encounter with the creature, reports were filed, cleanup crews sent in to rid the facility of any trace of what transpired there. Our wounds began to heal, both physically and mentally. We knew there would be other missions, perhaps darker than this one, but we had survived. As a team, 
we emerged stronger and more resolute in the face of whatever terrors the next mission would hold. And with each battle won, and each fallen comrade honored, we continued to fight and protect the world from nightmares hidden in the depths of darkness. I had always been skeptical of the stories surrounding the abandoned factory on the outskirts of town. My name is Ethan O'Connell, a small-town cop in Waverly, Iowa. Today, I found myself on duty, investigating those strange rumors that had been circulating for years. As I patrolled the area, I couldn't shake off a feeling of unease. The factory itself was once a booming manufacturing plant for toys. However, due to some scandalous activity in the past, it had been shut down abruptly and left to rot. While observing the decayed facade, I cracked a joke to lighten up the situation. Looks like playtime's over for this place. I muttered to myself. I decided to further inspect the building and hesitantly pushed my way through a rusted metal door. The air inside was damp and suffocating. It was as if nobody had stepped foot in here since its closure. Creeping forward cautiously, I heard a faint sound coming from one of the dark corners of the factory floor. With my hand firmly gripping my gun, I followed the noise. To my horror, I stumbled upon what appeared to be multiple sets of human remains, their bones shattered and gnawed down to mere splinters. At that moment, something stirred in the shadows nearby. Out came an unnervingly large man, with eyes as cold as ice and skin like leather parchment stretched thin over his gaunt frame. He wore tattered clothing and sported a sinister smile. Though he didn't move towards me or speak, I could feel an unsettling menace emanating from him. A sense of dread washed over me, something I had never experienced before in all my years as a cop. As quickly as he appeared before me, he retreated further into the bowels of the factory. My instincts screamed not to follow him, but my sense of duty compelled me on. A chase ensued, with me tailing this monstrous stranger in utter silence. Despite moving as heavily and clumsily as you'd expect from a hulking figure like him, he seemed to know every inch of this forsaken place, making efforts to lose me in its labyrinthine depths. We made our way through a maze of conveyor belts and disused machinery, each turn growing darker than the last. At one point, I nearly slipped on a twisted mess of tangled wires spanning the floor, but managed to catch my balance with the quip. I should have brought my tap shoes. The haunting chase continued until we reached what appeared to be the factory's storage room. A terrifying sight greeted me there. An array of grisly trophies adorned every surface possible. The agonizing terror I felt in that moment made it clear that I was closing in on a truly evil person. Realizing I needed backup in this dire situation, I cautiously reached for my radio to call for help. As I was about to speak into it, something slammed into me from behind with tremendous force. Wounded and disoriented, I struggled to pick myself up from the ground my radio shattered and useless. Picking myself up from the ground, I surveyed the shattered remains of my radio. It was useless now, and I couldn't call for backup. Fear rose within me as I contemplated facing the monstrous man alone, but it only strengthened my resolve to end his reign of terror. I limped through the storage room, stepping over the gruesome trophies that the villain had collected. The room was filled with the stench of decay, making it difficult to breathe. But I pushed forward, knowing that the only way to survive this nightmare was to confront its source. The chase resumed as I followed the sinister figure through more twisting corridors and darkened rooms. His laughter echoed through the vast factory as he toyed with me, always remaining one step ahead in this twisted game he had created. The cat-and-mouse chase culminated in a large chamber filled with an assortment of weapons, knives, chainsaws, and rusted tools mounted on the walls like an exhibition. Realizing that there is no escape, and feeling a sense of desperation, 
I decided to make a stand and yelled out at him. Enough! Why are you doing this? Show yourself! He stepped out from behind a pillar, grinning menacingly, and clapped his hands mockingly before responding without words. Instead, he picked up a rusty meat cleaver from one of the tables and began to slowly approach me. Knowing that I couldn't fight him directly, my job as a cop taught me to know when I'm outmatched. I scanned the room for anything that could help me gain an advantage. My eyes fell upon a fire extinguisher mounted on a nearby wall. Rushing towards it, I grabbed the fire extinguisher just as he lunged at me with his cleaver. Using all my strength, despite my injuries, I swung it right at his head. The impact made him stagger back for a moment, but it wasn't enough to stop him. I knew I had to do something more drastic. Searching for anything that could prove useful, I spotted a canister of gasoline sitting among some discarded debris. Acting quickly, I grabbed the canister and doused the room in gasoline as he regained his balance. Igniting a nearby piece of cloth, I threw it into the pool of gasoline as I sprinted towards the exit. The room erupted in flames, forcing their way between me and my attacker. The monstrous man let out a guttural scream as the fire burned his skin, but it wasn't long before he was lost in the inferno. I stumbled out of the burning chamber, coughing and gasping for air. Though injured and exhausted, I managed to escape from the factory just as it fell to ash around me. In the following weeks, I ensured that that nightmarish place was properly investigated, discovering more remains of those who had fallen victim to that twisted individual. They were finally put to rest, and their families notified. Unable to shake off the events resting heavily on my shoulders, I was grateful for my colleagues' support as they helped bring some semblance of closure in dealing with this gruesome affair. The sinister figure may be gone and justice served, yet even now, when darkness descends on long nights spent patrolling quiet streets, or when silence overwhelms me, those cold eyes and sinister smiles still haunt me like shadows lurking just beyond my reach. I stepped into the dank, dimly lit warehouse. My name is Ezekiel Branson. Every hair on my body stood on edge as I surveyed the ominous space. I was a green beret, trained to endure and survive in situations like this one a covert mission to unmask an enigmatic predator lurking in the shadows of Sterling City. As I proceeded, the silence suffocated me like a blanket, heavy and suffocating. My colleague, Dorinda Pembleton, tiptoed behind me as we scanned the massive warehouse for any hint of what we were up against. Slowly making our way past haphazard arrangements of rusty machinery and crates, we communicated through hand signals, careful not to give away our position. What do you call an alligator in a vest? Dorinda whispered at one point, maintaining her vigilance while attempting to break the tension. An investigator, she giggled softly. Suppressing a chuckle, we stifled our frivolity and focused on the task at hand. The faint smell of iron lingered in the air as we found evidence of this malevolent creature's handiwork, a mutilated body splayed on the warehouse floor. Upon closer inspection of its gruesomely disfigured remains momentarily overwhelmed us both with dread. Ezekiel, something is watching us. Dorinda muttered nervously. She was right. Although we couldn't see it yet, something monstrous was lurking nearby. As we pressed on deeper into the darkness, with gun ready to fire at the first sign of danger, we heard an otherworldly growl reverberating through the stale air. As soon as it began, it ceased leaving only agony and suspense pounding in our hearts. The creature suddenly appeared before us. Its grotesque visage was unlike anything I'd ever seen, but even more horrifying was its bone-chilling snarl. Standing over eight feet tall, its skin was an unnatural shade of dark green, with patches of coarse hair and irregular patterns. Bulging muscles rippled along its body, 
covered in grotesque black veins. Its razor-sharp talons gleamed, hungering for our blood. Spying the creature's mouth encircled by rows upon rows of jagged teeth, I understood why no one had dared to speak its name. Dorinda and I wasted no time in opening fire on the monster. As we unleashed a hailstorm of bullets upon the monstrosity, it emitted an ear-piercing shriek and lunged at us both with staggering speed. With adrenaline pumping through my veins, I narrowly dodged a vicious swipe from its talons, tearing my sleeve and leaving a trail of warm blood running down my arm. Dorinda wasn't as lucky. Mortally wounded from the beast's strike, she crumpled to the ground with a pain-riddled gasp. I tried to keep my fear in check as I dragged Dorinda behind a pile of debris, her blood soaking through my hands. We had to find a way out of this nightmare. Through the darkness, I could see the beast sniffing the air, hunting us down. A sudden thought crossed my mind perhaps the creature was relying on our scent. I took off my bloody jacket, threw it as far away from us as possible, and hoped it would buy us some time. The creature paused, then chased after the jacket, giving us a small window of opportunity to hobble away. Though weakened and disoriented from her injuries, Dorinda managed to push through the pain as we continued our desperate escape. As we stumbled along through the gloom, I noticed a faint light up ahead. It looked like an exit. Trying to remain as quiet as possible, I helped Dorinda move toward it while keeping an eye on the beast. Luckily, it was still distracted by my ploy. We finally reached the light source, an abandoned warehouse with windows covered in grime. With renewed hope, I managed to pry open a door just wide enough for us both to squeeze through. The pain in my arm flared up again, but getting to safety was our priority. Once inside, I locked the door and searched for something to barricade it with while Dorinda slumped against the wall. Ezekiel, she whispered between labored breaths. Call for help. Right, I said as I pulled out my cell phone, but there was no signal. Using whatever strength she had left, Dorinda rummaged through her backpack and produced a walkie-talkie, our only hope now. She pressed the button and softly said, This is Dorinda. Requesting help, being pursued by unknown creature. We're in an abandoned warehouse. GPS coordinates are. She rattled off the numbers, and we waited for a response. Static filled the air, but finally, the radio crackled to life. Dorinda? This is Thomas. Hold on, we're coming. ETA 20 minutes. The relief was short-lived as the creature erupted into a blind rage, scraping and pounding at the door outside. I couldn't bear to see Dorinda in so much pain, so as silently as possible, I used the crowbar to help pry open a window just enough for us to slip out. Once outside, we managed to find an old shipping container where we could hide until help arrived. Locked inside with our nemesis still snarling outside, I took a good look at it through a small gap in the container. It looked similar to a creature I had once read about called the Wendigo. But of course, that creature was folklore. Minutes felt like hours as we waited and prayed that help would arrive in time. Finally, I heard familiar voices approaching and sighed with relief. Thomas and several others broke through the darkness, armed and ready for whatever lay ahead. As they spotted the creature still clawing at our metal hiding spot, they immediately opened fire on it, no room for hesitation or mercy. The monstrosity howled in pain before collapsing onto the ground. As paramedics rushed over to tend Dorinda's severe wounds, Thomas approached me with curiosity in his eyes. Ezekiel, he said quietly, I think this thing you encountered is what locals call Ella Cashton. Ella Cashton? I asked. It means the green nightmare in their language, Thomas continued. From what little we know of it from local legends, it is one of their most feared creatures. Shaken from my harrowing experience but grateful that we had fought off whatever this creature truly was, 
Be it truth or legend, I helped the paramedics carry Dorinda to safety. My heart filled with both relief and mourning for those who had suffered at the hands of the Alakashton. I want to tell you something that happened to me, and trust me, it's worth your time. I promise by the end of this, you'll feel like you were there with me. There I was, deep in the Appalachian Mountains after moving from my busy city life to a small town called Oldsville. It was a fresh start, a place where I could unwind and enjoy the simpler things in life. My name is Cedric Lothrop, and my new life in the rural landscape seemed almost too perfect. The locals spoke with thick accents and shared tales of mythical creatures that roamed around the forests near the town late at night. It felt like folklore that had been passed down for generations, fairy tales that were amusing but not terrifying. As an outsider, I laughed along with them. These stories seemed like harmless fun. One evening, as casual conversations carried on in the local bar, my neighbor and friend Eunice Killingsworth said, Did anyone hear about the mangled body they found deep in the woods yesterday? The sheriff says it was like some kind of animal attack. An unsettling feeling crept into the room as everyone fell silent for a moment. We began debating what could have caused such a gruesome event. My skepticism returned with a hint of unease because now we weren't just talking about spooky stories anymore. This was something real that had happened to someone within our small community. Over time... The atmosphere gradually returned to normal, but my curiosity got the better of me. A few friends and I decided to explore the back roads of our new town late at night which led us deeper into the thick Appalachian foliage. Our path took us close to where they discovered the mutilated body. As we approached the site, we saw something that made our hearts pound rapidly within our chests. An enormous creature with half-humanoid features standing on two legs moved stealthily through a clearing in front of us. The hair on the back of my neck bristled as I looked at the abomination. Its muscular upper limbs were disproportionately long and ended in powerful, clawed hands while its lower limbs were reminiscent of a wolf's, sharing the same hawks and paw-like feet. It stood at least eight feet tall and towered over us menacingly its unnatural appearance and horrendous amalgamation of man and beast. We froze in place, the air electrified with fear as we tried our best to barely breathe. The urge to call out for help possessed me until I realized that doing so would only seal my fate. My voice carried through the still night air, summoning the malevolent beast directly to us. Arnold Fletcherworth tried to soothe his terrified wife Beatrix with a low, trembling voice. Stay calm, stay silent. In agonizing silence, we quickly retreated from the area to contemplate what we had just witnessed and attempted to rationalize it. Each step was calculated. Any sound could have brought that horrific creature hunting us down. I had never experienced such absolute dread before and could only imagine what those unfortunate enough to have encountered it went through. Days turned into weeks and my once peaceful life now felt haunted by the knowledge of this hybrid monstrosity lurking just beyond our peaceful neighborhood's boundary. It felt surreal when I began locking doors and sleeping with a loaded gun under my pillow. What once was mere folklore turned into a terrifying ordeal that had rooted itself deep in our minds. I tried visiting Eunice for solace when life became unbearable but found no comfort as her worried brown eyes darted around whenever she walked past the window. It seemed that I was not alone. Everyone seemed affected by this sinister infestation. One day while driving through town listening to the radio, I heard Oldsville's sheriff describe an ongoing investigation involving an individual suspected of committing heinous crimes. The chilling description caught my attention. Large, half-man, half-canine, bipedal creature lurking in the Appalachians. And as the sheriff continued to speak, I felt a chill run down my spine. 
It reminded me of that blood-curdling evening when we encountered the beast. Now I've become a prisoner within my own home, surrounded by paranoid neighbors and uncontrollable fear. But even in this state, I hold on to the hope of exposing the truth behind this violent creature before others fall prey to its horrifying desires. One morning, as the threat of the horrific creature weighed heavily on my mind, I decided to stop at a local library in search of any information or news about similar incidents in the area. Scouring through historical newspapers and articles, I stumbled upon accounts of a creature with similar features to the one we had encountered, referred to as a dogman. My curiosity heightened, and knowing that this information was crucial, I decided to share this with Eunice and other neighbors so that we could collectively tackle the situation. At a hastily organized meeting in Eunice's living room, I presented what I'd found, deliberately avoiding any mention of folklore or supernatural explanations in order not to incite panic. To my surprise, others shared their stories and experiences with the creature as well revealing that the dogman had caused misery throughout Oldsville for years. Alice Jackson tearfully recounted how her uncle disappeared two years ago during a hunting trip when he wandered off alone. She suspected that he had encountered this fearsome beast. A plan was devised. George Wright, an experienced hunter and tracker in the community, suggested setting up cameras along the town's perimeter to capture evidence of the creature's movements and better understand its behavior. We agreed that this would be our best course of action without putting anyone else in imminent danger. George took charge of installing the cameras along with a few volunteers while I continued researching past encounters with dogman creatures. The attacks seemed to increase during particular times every year when prey was scarce for carnivorous predators. Days later, we gathered again to review footage from the cameras. Our collective breaths caught when undeniable evidence presented itself. The dogman existed and posed an immediate threat to our community. Pardon me, said Paul Jenkins, interrupting our heavy silence. Look here. He pointed towards tracks found near his chicken coop earlier that day. Armed with evidence of this monster marauding our town, I made the call to the sheriff. I knew that people might not believe us without concrete proof, and Oldsville's residents needed protection immediately. The sheriff listened intently to our findings and pledged to investigate it further. We could only hope that his intervention would make a difference. Our town lived under constant tension as news of the dogman's presence spread with spread families protecting their livestock and confining children with insecure boundaries. Everybody was on high alert. Just when all seemed lost, the sheriff returned to Oldsville after investigating the nearby mountains. Accompanied by experts from an animal control agency, he provided confirmation that we were indeed dealing with an aggressive pack of dog men threatening our community. People sighed in relief as the officials took charge, promising to track down and capture the menacing creatures. As days turned into weeks, one by one, they removed the dogman threat from the area. The captured creatures were relocated far away from human settlements and essential precautions were taken to prevent them from returning. Those affected by their violent acts reminisced about their lost loved ones, Alice quietly remembering her uncle who had disappeared during that fateful hunting incident. Slowly but surely, life began to return to normal in Oldsville. Our community had survived a collective nightmare that bonded us closer together with a shared experience we hoped would never repeat itself again. In the end, as I sat on my porch, the newfound tranquility allowing me to reflect on recent events, I couldn't help but be grateful for having found enough information and support within my community to confront this seemingly insurmountable threat together. My life would never be the same again, but at least now we had a solid plan in place for protecting ourselves and facing similar incidents head-on. I came away with a renewed appreciation for vigilance 
knowing that sometimes even the quietest places held secrets terrifying beyond imagination. Secrets waiting for someone brave enough to examine the shadows and bring them into the light. As a search and rescue officer for the U.S. Forest Service, my priorities have always been focused on helping those in need, whether it's a group of hikers gone astray or a child who wandered off and got lost. On the day of the incident, I was working with my team in a remote, secluded area of the Cascade Mountains in Washington State. The day began pretty mundane, as most do. We were discussing what to expect for lunch while waiting for our briefing. In the middle of our conversation, my partner Charlie interrupted with an excited tone. He had stumbled upon an article describing some unexplained and downright bizarre animal attacks that had recently been taking place in our area. Of course, we're used to occasional wild animal encounters out here, bears, cougars and such, but these reports seemed much more peculiar. Victims found with odd-looking wounds attacked without any discernible reason or pattern. Though alarmed, we brushed it off as mostly baseless rumors. That evening, our team received an emergency call about an injured hiker in distress deep within the woods. We quickly grabbed our gear and headed towards the GPS location provided by dispatch. As we progressed deeper into the forest, an eerie silence encompassed the area even though dusk was still at least a couple of hours away. As we reached the hiker's last known location, perhaps driven by intuition or pure coincidence, I scanned my surroundings, and that's when I saw it for the first time. Up on a hill at some distance stood a dark silhouette that just didn't quite belong there. Charlie saw it too and immediately pointed his flashlight towards it. A tall figure with elongated limbs crouched in the underbrush stared back at us, unnervingly quiet. It didn't resemble any animal native to these woods. Something about its posture was just... off. Charlie! Was all managed to say before he cut me off. No need to worry, buddy. I'll radio the patrol to keep an eye out, and we'll make sure the injured hiker gets out of here safely. His forced smile betrayed his genuine concern. As we cautiously tended to the hiker, who had a broken leg, the creature continued to observe us from a distance, not making any attempts to approach. Eventually, with the hiker on a makeshift stretcher, we escorted him back towards our vehicle while remaining vigilant of potential threats. Not long after we started leading the hiker back, we heard rustling bushes from behind us. The figure darted between the trees at an unnatural speed. In that moment, I sensed danger like never before and frantically urged the group to quicken their pace. We have company, I whispered nervously. While carrying our injured charge, maintaining a constant speed proved impossible. The peculiar creature stayed close behind us emerging then disappearing like a sinister apparition, as if taunting us in a predator's chase. Out of nowhere, Charlie gasped as suddenly we saw yet another seemingly identical figure ahead blocking our path. We were surrounded and left with few options. Realizing how rapidly the situation was escalating, I made a gut-wrenching decision no time for backup nor explanations. Only swift action held any hope of survival. We need to split up! I shouted as I handed off my end of the stretcher to Charlie. With a brief nod of understanding, he took over my position while I prepared myself for whatever confrontation was about to take place. As Charlie and three other team members retreated cautiously with the injured hiker between them, I veered off in another direction where yet another creature lurked. My heart pounding fiercely in my chest, I braced myself for whatever horror lay ahead, 
knowing full well that my sacrifice might be the only thing keeping these monstrous fiends from my teammates and their vulnerable patient. I sprinted towards the creature in front of me, hurling a nearby rock at it as I ran. The creature dodged the projectile with unnatural speed and agility. My movements attracted its attention, and it began to pursue me. I knew deep down that my chances of outrunning this thing were slim, but I had to try for the sake of my team and the injured hiker. As I plunged deeper into the forest, I fumbled for my radio, desperately hoping to call for help. As soon as I found the button to initiate communication, though, a chilling realization hit me communicating with the outside world could potentially alert more of these creatures to our presence. I decided against calling for help unless absolutely necessary. With my pursuer closing in on me, any possible weapon was better than none. I searched for anything that could be used against the creature a fallen branch, a jagged piece of rock anything with potential lethality. Suddenly, another horrifying figure emerged from behind a tree it appeared to be coordinated with its counterpart in pursuit of me. Outnumbered and outmatched, I feverishly racked my brain for an impromptu strategy. I recalled a small river not far from my current location. Perhaps if I led the creatures there, they might lose track of us or at least delay their pursuit long enough for us to escape. The plan risky yet feasible, I lunged forth through bushes and debris towards the riverbank. My lungs burned and legs complained but terror drove me forward. Breaching through one last bush line, the river finally came into sight. I jumped into its cold embrace without hesitation. The swift current pulled me downstream as the two creatures stood on the bank baffled by my sudden disappearance. Though this provided temporary respite, their cunning gazes seemed intent on locating their target. As distance grew between us, I clambered onto land further downstream from the creatures. I found a fallen tree and decided to hide in its shadows, hoping my scent would be complex to discern for these cold-blooded attackers. I couldn't help but anguish over the fate of my team and the hiker. A myriad of gruesome scenarios played out in my mind as I cowered beneath that log, guilt-ridden for leaving them behind. Still, I was determined to make sure their lives weren't sacrificed in vain. Eventually, as the sky began to brighten, a sense of urgency propelled me from hiding. Tired and battered, I stealthily made my way back towards our vehicle, prudence now paramount. To my immense relief, I found Charlie and the other members of our team at the vehicle tending to the injured hiker, seemingly unharmed. You came back, Charlie exclaimed, catching sight of me. Yeah, I breathed. Managed to lose those things. We shared a glance that relayed relief and lingering anxiety. As soon as possible we radioed for immediate extraction. There were no objections this time. While we waited for our rescue team to arrive, I noticed how closely everyone remained together an inexplicable bond forged through shared terror. As we had survived our ordeal without casualties, there were no victims to remember. However, the unrelenting threat of those creatures lurked in every shadow and remained etched into our consciousness. When the rescue helicopter arrived at last, we didn't waste any time evacuating from that accursed forest without answering hard questions about those surreal encounters. The lives of those who crossed paths with these creatures would never be the same again a perennial shadow cast within our minds. We never found out what exactly they were or why they prowled these woods. Some forces are beyond human ken. Complacency gave way to humility in face of such unfathomable horrors lurking in our world's hidden corners. And yet, amidst this newfound vulnerability, we persevered this harrowing experience testament to the resilience and courage dwelling within each of us.
My name is Dorian Whitlock, and I am a field researcher for an environmental consulting firm in Maine. Our work takes us deep into the wilderness, surveying remote landscapes untouched by people. Last summer, during a woodland project, I found myself entwined in the most harrowing experience of my life. It all began on an unusually overcast Thursday morning while setting up the equipment in a dense forest with my colleague, Quincy Lamott. We chatted more than usual as we went about our duties to combat the increasing unease invading us from the clusters of shadows looming heavily among the trees. After getting everything assembled, we went our separate ways to conduct individual surveying routes. An unusual chill permeated through the summer day, prompting me to don a jacket despite my history of never getting cold. As I conducted the necessary tests for our research, there was something strangely unsettling about my surroundings. The wind howled through the trees like tortured moans and fallen branches that littered the ground appeared twisted in unearthly shapes of agony. After some moments, I even started having second thoughts about any form of communication but refrained from reaching out to Quincy my skepticism got the better of me. As dusk approached and daylight dwindled, I spotted a shadowed figure standing in the distance its posture crooked and unnatural. Taking several cautious steps closer, I noticed its head resembled that of a deer or elk skull with massive antler-like protrusions sprouting from atop its head. Its limbs appeared elongated with impossibly sharp streaks of shattered light glistening on its bony fingers. Fear crawled up my spine like icy fingers as I realized the weapon it grasped resembled pieces of my work equipment, and knowing it had torn apart our camp. Frantically realizing I couldn't communicate with Quincy through the radio for fear he would be next, I hesitated. The creature looked in my direction and sniffed the air. Its eyes empty and void, seemed to penetrate my very soul as they locked onto mine from beneath the shadow of the skull adorning its head. This was uncharted territory for me, and all those previous moments paled in comparison to the raw terror I felt. Attempting to retreat slowly and quietly in hopes of reaching Quincy before the creature could, I stumbled through the forest silently cursing myself for not having brought a firearm. An unknown force compelled me to glance back. The creature had started following at its own languid pace, savoring my fear with every step it took closer. Trying to rein in the panic taking hold of my chest, I thought about creating a diversion with our highly flammable research supplies. If successful, this would grab the creature's attention just long enough for me and Quincy to make our escape. As if sensing my plans, the creature leapt onto a nearby boulder with unnatural grace and speed. A twisted grin adorned the grotesque skull-like face as it observed my reaction. Time seemed to slow as I struggled to find a way out of this impossible situation. Suddenly, Quincy burst into the clearing shock evident on his face as he took in not only my distress but the approaching creature. And then he saw our equipment strewn among splintered trees' dead eyes reflecting shattered light. With our limited options waning quickly and our lives on the line, I frantically gestured for Quincy to rush towards me as I started scrambling for anything that might work as a rudimentary weapon against whatever hellish entity we faced. As Quincy and I scrambled to gather whatever we could from our research supplies, the creature flexed its muscles and lunged forward. It extended its long, antler-like limbs, each ending in a sharp point. Quincy and I ducked just as it struck, missing us by mere inches. We knew that calling for help was futile at this point. The dense forest would muffle any cries making it nearly impossible for anyone else to hear us. We also didn't want to risk aggravating this creature further. Quincy, run! I shouted, 
adrenaline coursing through my veins. We bolted in opposite directions, both desperately trying to put distance between ourselves and the creature. Weaving through the trees, I heard Quincy scream in pain followed by a guttural and sinister laughter from the creature. My gut twisted with worry for my friend as I continued running. Ahead, I noticed a partially buried rock with a jagged edge jutting out of the ground. Using what little energy I had remaining, I sprinted toward it before quickly ducking behind it for cover. I tried to regulate my heavy breathing, praying it wouldn't give away my position. The creature lumbered past me slowly but didn't seem to notice my presence as it continued searching for its prey. After what felt like an eternity of evading death's grasp, the thing seemed to give up its search for me but it left in the same direction it took Quincy earlier. I waited a few more minutes before carefully standing up from my hiding place and retracing the path I hoped would lead me back to Quincy. Along the way, signs of struggle were more than visible, overturned rocks and broken branches littered the ground. Finally reaching Quincy's location, my heart dropped when the gruesome sight met my eyes. Claw marks raked across his body as he lay motionless on the forest floor. The bloodied gashes painted a horrifying picture. Shaking with conflict, I knew I had to do something to save Quincy. I rushed closer to him, relieved when I found that his pulse was weak but still there. Without wasting any more time, I used my belt to create a makeshift tourniquet on Quincy's leg to lessen the blood loss. Stay with me, Quincy, I muttered as I tried my best not to break down in tears. I knew our only hope was getting back to our car since the creature seemed to have vanished for now. It would be a strenuous task, but I had no other choice. Gathering whatever strength I had left, I hoisted Quincy over my shoulder and started the long journey back. Luck was on our side that day. We worked together to keep each other alert and moving until we reached the car successfully. The journey felt like it took an eternity, but we managed to escape that forest leaving the creature behind us for now. Quincy got medical help upon arrival at the closest hospital and somehow pulled through despite severe blood loss and multiple deep lacerations. We were scarred, emotionally and physically, by that horrifying encounter. It may seem unbelievable or downright crazy if I were ever to share our story, two researchers attacked by a monstrous creature while working in the remote wilderness. Despite its gruesome nature, one thing was clear— we finally understood why locals avoided venturing too deep into that untamed forest. The beast that haunted those woods refused to let anyone out of its claws unabated. As for Quincy and me? Now bound even closer by survival and circumstance beyond belief, our friendship grew stronger though its origin laid in the tragic torture at the claws of an ungodly creature lurking within the shadows of an unsuspecting forest. It was just another uneventful laundry day as I trudged down the long, dusty path to the laundromat. My arms ached from carrying the overflowing basket of clothes. Sometimes I found amusement in not washing my clothes for three or four weeks, just to have a small reason for complaining on nights like this. I went to an old, forgotten laundromat on the outskirts of Concord, New Hampshire, simply because it was closest to my isolated cabin, and there certainly wasn't any chance of running into someone who knew me here being that it was pretty much abandoned. As I entered the dimly lit laundromat, its rusty metal door squeaked with discomfort. The faint hum of washing machines and dryers filled the otherwise silent room. One flickering fluorescent light hovered above me as I began loading up machines. 
Three others were scattered around the periphery of the worn-out tile floor. As I fed quarters into the last washer, I pressed play on my favorite true crime podcast and settled onto a rickety wooden bench near the front door. The voice recounting harrowing tales kept my mind occupied, drowning out eerie silence that surely would have consumed me otherwise. As my clothes tumbled rhythmically in their metal carriages, I noticed an odd scratching sound coming from outside. Casually glancing through the cracked glass window by the entrance, I squinted trying to discern what could make such noise. Adjusting my focus past my reflection in the window, my heart nearly leapt out of my chest as I saw an enormous creature loping across the overgrown grass behind the laundromat. The vile beast appeared to be something from my wildest nightmares, half man and half wolf with disturbing human-like movement, but with fur-covered limbs that ended in massive claws. Instinctively, I ducked below the windowsill while hyperventilating and thinking, How can something like this exist? I knew I should call for help, but something inside me urged not to. If anyone found out about my uncanny encounter, they'd surely think me mad. And yet, there was no denying that the grotesque thing I had just witnessed was real. As my mind raced, I hesitated to make sense of what I had seen. The creature was long gone, but its mere existence plagued me with an icy fear I couldn't shake. My heart continued pounding in my chest as it begged me to leave this forsaken place. I must be going crazy, I thought aloud to myself. Torn between curiosity and terror, I couldn't resist peeking through the window again, hoping to catch another glimpse. Instead, I saw something equally disturbing, blood-splattered tire treads leading into the woods behind the laundromat. The gruesome scene made my stomach churn with revulsion. Gulping down the urge to vomit and trying not to let my imagination run wild, I slowly gathered my courage and ventured outside. The cool evening air did little to calm my nerves as I followed the bloody tire tracks toward their ominous destination. As I reached a tree line, a sense of dread washed over me when I realized that these tracks didn't lead into the woods after all. Suddenly, a primal howl shattered the stillness of the air around me as if on cue. Panic overtook me as it tore through my veins at record speed, demanding immediate action. My knees buckled beneath me as an unexpected quake shook the earth beneath my trembling feet. With the howl reverberating in my ears and the ground still trembling under my feet, I stumbled, quickly regaining balance. Aware that I couldn't afford to spend another second contemplating the implications of what I'd seen, I turned and sprinted back toward the laundromat. Once inside, I slammed the door shut and frantically searched for something to barricade it. Seizing a metal chair, I wedged it under the door handle hoping it might buy me some time. As I scanned the area for any more possible escape routes, I noticed a rear exit leading to the parking lot. With one last look through the cracked glass window, I bolted towards the exit, my earlier reluctance about calling for help now overridden by terror. As soon as I got outside, I took out my phone and dialed 911. The operator picked up on the second ring, her calm voice providing me with a brief moment of solace. This is 911. Please state your emergency, she said. There's a huge creature attacking, people are hurt, and blood, help, at the laundromat. Please send someone quickly. My words tumbled out in rapid gasps, filled with panic. All right, sir, please calm down and tell me your location. I gave her my location while desperately glancing around for any sign of the monstrous being. Within moments, she assured me that help was on its way. With nothing left to do but wait for assistance to arrive, I huddled near one of the cars in the parking lot. 
The sound of sirens approaching brought a slight sense of relief until they were suddenly overwhelmed by an ear-piercing shriek from behind. I hesitated for a moment before spinning around to face whatever horrors lay beyond. To my astonishment, there stood an ordinary-looking man covered with deep gashes and wounds on his body, yet he didn't appear to be in any pain. Instead, his once-human face stared blankly ahead with an unsettling expression. Cautiously, I approached him. Sir, are you all right? I've called the police. They're on their way. He continued to stare, giving no indication that he'd heard me. As the sirens grew closer, I tried again to communicate with him. Did you see that thing too? What happened? His eyes suddenly locked onto mine, and in a low voice devoid of emotion, he whispered, There's no escape. It won't stop. Before I could decipher his cryptic statement, the police arrived. They quickly ushered us away from the scene and began questioning us about our harrowing encounters. In the chaotic aftermath, both victims and witnesses shared their accounts of what had transpired during the attack. Some described seeing the monstrous creature as it brutally mauled its targets without discrimination. Others spoke of individuals reduced to unresponsive shells like the man I'd encountered. Despite everyone relaying their experiences in different ways, one message remained consistent. We were all victims of an unspeakable horror that defied explanation. The police took statements and photographs but seemed skeptical about our claims at first. However, after finding several bodies torn apart in gruesome detail at the edge of the woods near the blood-stained tire tracks, doubt turned to bewilderment or even fear. As news broke of what transpired at the laundromat, families mourned those lost in the attack and demanded answers from authorities who were just as perplexed by the situation as everyone else. With no clear resolution to this nightmare for those scarred by it both physically and mentally life went on uneasily for those who survived. The whispers circulating among grocery lines and coffee shops questioned if such malevolent presences still lurked around us. But like any other unsolved tragedy, it eventually faded from public consciousness. Though I've tried to resume normalcy in my own life, the vivid memories of that night still haunt me. No one can ever truly understand what it felt like to stare into the eyes of an inexplicable and unfathomable horror, knowing that somewhere within the recesses of the unknown, it may still exist waiting for another opportunity to strike. Working as a park ranger in the dense forests of Idaho certainly has its perks. It's the kind of job that really tests your senses, bringing me closer to nature than I ever thought possible. Although I may be an expert in identifying wild plants, tracking animals and telling people to stop littering, there are moments that my confidence is shaken to its core. This one particular day brought a truckload of such situations my way. My name is Harrison Sovel. As a park ranger, it's my job to know everything there is about the ecosystem and the living creatures within these sprawling green boundaries. My life took an unexpected turn when a series of grisly events spread waves of panic across the area. It all started when unexplained carcasses kept turning up, disfigured and mutilated beyond recognition. I chalked it up to some sick individual, some psychopath getting his kicks by poisoning animals or setting traps around the park. It wasn't until later that I realized something much more sinister was at play. My colleague Jake Myers and I were on patrol duty one afternoon when we decided to take different routes through the forest, hoping to cover more ground that way. We had walkie-talkies with us just in case either of us needed assistance or spotted something unusual. As I went deeper into the forest, I suddenly saw something terrifying, 
the remains of a hiker about 200 feet away from me. Fighting back the urge to vomit, I examined the scene closely. The sheer brutality with which this person met their end was impossible to comprehend. Limbs twisted and torn from their sockets, flesh shredded apart as if pulled apart by hooks or chains. Whoever or whatever did this possess such raw strength that even an experienced wrestler would have shuddered in fear. Frantically grabbing my walkie-talkie, I called for Jake urgently. Jake! You need to get here now. There's been another attack, this time on a person. God, it's terrible! I exclaimed. Just stay put, Harrison. I'm coming as fast as I can. His genuinely worried voice came through the other end. As I waited for Jake to arrive, I couldn't help but feel the silence engulfing the forest around me. A strange rustling in the foliage nearby made me jump, and an overwhelming smell of decay and rot filled my nostrils, making my stomach churn. Suddenly, faint growling sounds seemed to come from every direction. Jake finally arrived on scene about ten minutes later, panting and trying to grasp what he was seeing in front of him. He looked pale as he stared at the lifeless body. What the hell could do something like this? He muttered. We didn't have much time to speculate further. The shadows around us seemed to twist and morph as a creature with enormous leathery wings stretched high above its head stepped into view before us. Its eyes shone like two burning coals full of malice and hate, almost as if it had been waiting for someone to come across its handiwork. Towering over us at perhaps nine feet tall, its muscular form covered in dark scales glimmered in the scarce sunlight that penetrated through the tree branches overhead. A pair of sharp, ivory-like talons adorned each of its massive hands, dripping with a foul, viscous substance. Pure terror seized our bodies as we stared up at this monstrosity, a being that no human mind could truly comprehend. Was it even possible that a creature from folklore could be roaming our forests? The idea was absurd, but so too was the sight before us. We knew we wouldn't stand a chance if we tried to fight this thing. Maybe if we were lucky enough to survive we could figure out who or what this creature was based on what little knowledge we had gleaned about the supernatural throughout our lives. The creature let out a guttural roar, and adrenaline surged through my veins. Jake and I sprinted in opposite directions, desperate to escape from this nightmare. Every footstep seemed like an eternity, and my mind raced with thoughts of never seeing my loved ones again. As the enormous creature roared at us, Jake and I ran in opposite directions, knowing that staying together could lead to our certain deaths. The forest was a maze, but all that mattered now was putting as much distance between the creature and ourselves as possible. Even though we avoided calling for help on our phones because we thought no one would believe our story, the police had been contacted about the attack on a person in the area. Thankfully, they were already on their way when we faced the terrifying creature. Despite my best efforts to call for help, my voice cracked from fear and exhaustion. The growls continued to resonate behind me, striking terror with each reverberation. A stream of sweat poured down my face as I tried to focus solely on running away. Breathing heavily, I managed to reach a clearing where at least three police cars were parked. The officers stepped out of their vehicles with weapons drawn, ready for whatever they were about to encounter. However, their expressions revealed genuine fear upon hearing the ominous growls from the distance. One officer cautiously approached me and asked what had happened. As I spoke about the lifeless body we found and the monstrous creature that had confronted us, his incredulity was palpable. Still, he signaled for his team to advance toward the area I had come from. Meanwhile, Jake managed to find his way back too. Bruised and out of breath, he walked up to me pale-faced and trembling. 
Together we watched as law enforcement headed into the woods in an attempt to capture or kill the seemingly mythical beast responsible for the gruesome attacks. The echoing gunshots rang through the air whilst we awaited any news on the outcome of their efforts. Minutes later, two officers stumbled their way out of the forest drenched in sweat, but otherwise unscathed. Their faces were twisted in horror as they described what they saw. The officers reported that they'd encountered the creature, now lying dead on the forest floor. Its large scales were impenetrable to bullets, but a powerful shot towards one of its eye sockets had managed to penetrate its brain. The monstrous being's reign of terror was finally over. Both Jake and I felt a strange mix of relief and unease upon hearing this news, realizing that what we had experienced that day was unlike anything anyone would ever understand. It was nearly impossible to process what had just happened, from the attack on a person to the forest showdown between law enforcement and an inexplicable creature. When news of this event reached media outlets, many dismissed it as an elaborate hoax orchestrated by locals in search of attention. Despite this skepticism, law enforcement confirmed the authenticity and seriousness of this case although no logical explanation for the creature's existence could be established. Weeks later, life in our community began returning to normalcy as people slowly regained their sense of security. Jake and I met occasionally to discuss that horrifying day when we faced that malevolent monster in the forest. The victims including the person whose brutal death caused us to stumble upon this horrific reality were laid to rest leaving those who knew them with unbearable pain and unanswered questions about what exactly had unfolded in those woods. As for both Jake and me, that day forever changed our lives knowing that such monsters could manifest into a horrifying reality. Try as we might, we could never forget or escape its malevolent gaze, its piercing eyes etched into our minds reminding us that not all nightmares remain in the realm of dreams. Working as a top-secret geneticist for the U.S. government led me to many interesting places, but the most unforgettable experience happened in a secluded facility tucked deep within the forests of Oregon. I had always found great satisfaction in my work, but there was always a constant underlying sense of isolation and secrecy, knowing that I couldn't share the details of my everyday life with friends or family. One ordinary day, as I sipped my morning coffee and prepared for another day of complex research, I overheard my colleague Marcus whispering about some strange events that had recently occurred in the surrounding woods. It's like something from those old folk tales, he said nervously to another co-worker. The thought piqued my curiosity, but I reminded myself to focus on our ongoing projects. After all, they held major implications for national security. That same day after work, Marcus approached me as if he could no longer hold back his thoughts. Michael, he started. I know you've been really focused on your research lately, but something's been happening in these woods that we need to discuss. I begrudgingly agreed to listen as we walked toward our cars parked beside the remote facility. Marcus described how several colleagues had encountered bizarre incidents during their commute or walks through the wooded area surrounding our workplace. He mentioned how one woman found grotesque scratch marks on her car door, and how another researcher discovered his tire slashed seemingly by a large knife or claw. Marcus himself saw something lurking in the shadows that he couldn't quite explain. It was humanoid in shape but moved with uncanny speed and agility. Despite my initial skepticism, his story sent shivers down my body. 
Little did we know this was just the beginning of our encounter with an unknown man or monster who would change our lives forever. Several days later, while working late into the night on a sensitive genetic engineering project related to human augmentation, I experienced my own chilling situation. As I stepped out of the facility for some fresh air, I noticed peculiar rustling noises coming from the thick forested area around me. Suddenly, a fleeting figure crossed my path which was unlike anything I had ever seen. It stood on two legs but appeared hunched over and covered with hair. Its eyes were dark and hollow, its mouth filled with sharp teeth. I felt sick to my stomach as we exchanged sinister looks and it vanished into the trees with an eerie giggle. Overwhelmed by the terrifying event, I called Marcus immediately. You were right, I stammered breathlessly. I saw it too. Knowing we should report this to our superiors, fearing for our safety and that of our colleagues, we went straight to them with our accounts, only to be met with dismissal and scorn. We have much more important things to focus on, said Dr. Green sternly. No more nonsense about creatures in the woods. With no choice but to continue working in a place we now knew was dangerous, Marcus and I decided it was best to stick together. The days went by heavy with tension as we kept an eye out for any signs of our mysterious antagonist. One fateful night, Marcus contacted me in a panic. Michael, you need to come outside right now. As I closed the lab door behind me and cautiously approached him near the edge of the forest, my blood turned cold at what he pointed out, a trail of ominous claw marks leading towards the facility. As we scanned our surroundings for any threats, headlights approached us from the distance through the darkness before screeching to a halt. My heart raced as the car door opened, revealing an injured co-worker clutching her leg. I... I tried to call someone earlier. It's not safe here. She gasped through tears before collapsing into my arms. The weight of her despair was like a stone upon my chest, and I knew our unseen enemy was drawing closer. We realized that we had to call for help immediately. Panicked, Marcus dialed 911 while I tended to our injured co-worker. The operator asked us about our situation, and we could hear the skepticism in her voice as we described the creature stalking us. Still, she said help was on its way. With no time to waste, we carried our co-worker back into the facility, locking all doors and windows as best as we could. There had to be a way to protect ourselves until the authorities arrived if they even believed us enough to actually send help. Together, the three of us waited in a makeshift emergency room inside the lab, desperately trying to tend to our co-workers' wounds with the limited medical supplies available. Every creak and thud intensified our paranoia. Was it already inside? Was it waiting for an opportunity to strike? I excused myself momentarily to use the bathroom, heart pounding out of my chest. While washing my hands, I nervously glanced at my reflection in the mirror, and then something caught my eye, a large gash on the wall behind me, filled with splinters and broken tiles, a gash that was not there before. Bile rose in my throat as I sprinted back to Marcus and our co-worker, screaming at them that we needed to leave immediately. The creature would not wait for us, it wanted us now. The sound of police sirens in the distance did little to comfort us as adrenaline urged us forward. We abandoned the facility as quickly as possible, carrying our injured colleague between us in turns while keeping an eye out for signs of danger. Through heavy breaths and pounding hearts, we made it outside just in time to see multiple police cars surround the building. Relief washed over me like a tidal wave, but then realization hit home. The creature was still inside. 
The officers approached cautiously but visibly irritated by our seemingly ridiculous claims of a monster in the woods. Despite our protests, they insisted on investigating the facility, leaving us to huddle together on the cold ground outside. As we waited for what felt like hours, we occasionally caught glimpses of flashlights illuminating windows, casting shadows on the walls inside. Screams echoed throughout the night air as blood stained the lower windows and smeared across the glass. The terror inside had reached a crescendo. It was horrifyingly real. Finally, an officer emerged from the carnage, his eyes wide with fear as he stumbled towards us. He raised his radio, trembling and unable to form coherent words. It was clear that he now believed our story. We need backup out here. We need everyone you've got. There's a, there's something in there. This isn't a joke. In that moment, we knew our lives would never be the same again. We had experienced an indescribable horror that would linger with us forever. Days later, authorities had marked off the facility as a crime scene while investigations continued into the brutal attacks that had occurred inside. They managed to gather what remained of the bodies inside but could not find any trace of the creature. The search expanded into the surrounding woods and beyond, yielding no results. The remains of my co-workers were laid to rest as their families mourned their losses and tried to seek closure without knowing who or what had taken their loved ones away so violently. Thinking back to that chilling encounter in the woods remains painful as I wonder if anything could have been done differently. If there was a way that anyone could have seen it coming or prevented its rampage. But one thing was for sure. Humanity had taken a monumental step into the darkness through genetic engineering. Something that should never have been explored at all. Now aware of an ominous presence lurking in forgotten corners and dark places, we embarked on an existence filled with cautious steps and nervous glances. We prayed others would learn from our tragedy and understand the limits that science must never cross, for our own safety and for humanity's future. The dimly lit forest loomed ahead, and the damp, moss-covered ground squished underfoot as I trudged onward. My eyes strained to make out the faint trail that I had been following all day. Hank Abbott had invited me for a weekend fishing trip at his secluded cabin in Alaska, and I couldn't resist. Although, at this very moment, I questioned my decision-making skills. Why the hell did I agree to this? I muttered as branches smacked my face relentlessly. The forest seemed to close in on me with each step. It wasn't long before the sun disappeared behind the thick canopy of trees, casting me deeper into darkness. My flashlight flickered erratically, providing little light to guide my way. Panic welled up in my chest but quickly vanished when a sudden burst of adrenaline kicked in as I heard a hushed voice up ahead. Hey! Is that you up there? I shouted, catching sight of a figure slowly emerging. Yeah! My friend Hank laughed as he approached. You're such a city boy, getting lost out here. Good thing I can track like a pro! He slapped me jovially on the back, and we made our way towards his cabin. We spent that evening preparing for our morning fishing trip while swapping stories about work and life. As dusk settled around us, we sat by the fire listening to the quiet hum of insects serenading us from the shadows. I have to admit, Hank finally whispered as we stared into the dying embers of the fire pit. I've been hearing strange things out here lately. I arched an eyebrow skeptically but remained silent. I didn't want to bring it up earlier cause I thought you'd be spooked. 
Hank continued nervously. But last week when on a hunting trip right here in these woods, my friend Jake stumbled upon what looked like a half-eaten deer. The poor thing was ripped to shreds. It was unlike anything I've ever seen. The hair on the back of my neck prickled, a cold chill crawling down my spine. Lots of predators out here, man. I mumbled dismissively. No reason to freak yourself out. Hank hesitated before nodding in agreement. Yeah, you're right. Probably just a bear or something. We let the fire die and retreated into the cabin for the night, hoping that sleep would erase lingering thoughts of mutilated wildlife. The following morning, we loaded our fishing gear into Hank's boat and hit the water. I quickly forgot about Hank's eerie story as we cast our lines into the serene lake surrounded by dense vegetation. Hours passed as we enjoyed each other's company and caught more than our fair share of fish. As afternoon gave way to evening, we decided to head back to the cabin feeling triumphant with our catch and looking forward to another night by the fire. The boat bumped against the shoreline as we hopped out, knee-deep in ice-cold water. As I bent down to gather our gear, a ghastly scene unfolded before me. Oh my God, help me! cried an unrecognizable figure emerging from the thicket near Hank's cabin, their clothes torn and body bleeding profusely from several deep gashes. It was Jake's little brother Brian. Before I could react or question his presence in these woods or how he ended up in this state, Hank urgently shouted orders at me. Lock yourself inside the cabin and call 911. Hurry, there is something out here he exclaimed with a pale face before carefully maneuvering Brian onto his back and crouched protectively over him. I raced for the house as instructed, fumbling with my shaky hands when dialing emergency services. The dispatcher's voice rang in my ears, but it was nothing in comparison to the gut-wrenching screams that echoed outside. A blood-curdling roar tore through the night, shaking me to the core as I clutched my phone tightly, trying to make sense of it all. Through the window, a massive twisted figure stalked toward Hank and Brian, teeth bared and claws gleaming in the moonlight. The creature was something I couldn't even fathom where its existence came from existing folklore. Not wanting to waste a second, I yelled to Hank, I've called 911. What do we do now? Hank, still shielding Brian with his body, shouted back, Just stay inside. Whatever that thing is, it's dangerous. As the dispatcher tried to calm me down and assure me help was on its way, the monstrous figure lunged at Hank and Brian. The creature appeared as something that seemed like a horrific mix of man and wolf. Its muscular body was covered in matted fur, and it moved with unnatural agility and speed. Its eyes glowed an eerie yellow, reminiscent of a predator stalking in the darkness. Desperate to help but knowing I couldn't stand a chance against such a formidable adversary, I fumbled to lock the doors and windows while keeping an eye on the terrifying scene unfolding outside. The beast swiped at Hank with its massive clawed hand. He narrowly dodged the attack but couldn't avoid the next one that sliced through his arm, leaving crimson ribbons in its wake. His agonized screams were drowned out by another thunderous roar from the monster. In a final act of desperation, Hank managed to grab a nearby rock and hurled it at the beast's face. The creature reeled back momentarily from the impact giving Hank just enough time to drag himself and Brian towards the cabin door. Adrenaline fueled my actions as I tore open the door to let them in before snapping it shut just as the creature attempted another vicious swipe. We barricaded ourselves inside, every bone in our bodies shaking with terror as we heard the creature howling outside. 
I pressed towels against Hank's wounds as he cradled Brian's unconscious form in his lap and tried to stop his bleeding as well. After what felt like hours, even though it was only minutes, we heard sirens approaching through the oppressive darkness followed by a cacophony of gunfire and guttural shrieks. Flashing lights illuminated the cabin as law enforcement finally arrived, engaging the monstrous figure in an intense fight for survival. As the chaos slowly dissipated outside, we could only hope that our harrowing ordeal was finally coming to an end. In the aftermath, Hank and Brian were taken to the nearest hospital where they both received intensive treatment for their wounds. As for the grotesque monster that had nearly taken their lives, it was eventually subdued and captured by a special team of professionals who knew better than to let it escape into an unsuspecting world. Grateful for our survival and recovery, I attended a memorial service for those who lost their lives during the carnage. Their names and stories left a lasting impression on all of us who bore witness to the horrors inflicted by that nightmarish beast. With its capture, though, we also took solace in knowing it would never prey on anyone again. Despite not understanding much about folklore or the creature's true origins, we learned that some things are better left unknown. As time passed and life gradually returned to some semblance of normalcy for us and those affected by that fateful encounter, we knew that deep down, we would never forget the terrifying events that transpired, or the fallen whose sacrifices had saved our lives. I look back now at that dreadful night with painful clarity. Despite our shared trauma and loss of friends, what remains is a bond forged by our collective experience. We hold on to each other tighter than ever before, keenly aware of how fragile life is, and just how quickly it can be ripped from us by forces beyond our comprehension or control. It was the first time I spent Thanksgiving all by myself. A friend of mine told me that the best way to escape my roommate's holiday family reunion was to go on a camping trip. An opportunity for adventure filled with hiking and fishing. It turned out to be an unforgettable experience, but not in the way I'd expected. I rented an RV and serpentine through the highways of Oregon finally settling on Crater Lake National Park for its stunning volcanic caldera surrounded by clear blue waters. The park seemed like a gem, untarnished by tourist hordes. Perfect for a peaceful getaway. After setting up my camp, I grabbed my fishing gear and headed down to a secluded spot near the lake. Remarkably, it was an area that internet tourists hadn't discovered yet. I slowly began to unwind, until I felt something wet on my hand. Looking down with urgency, I saw some lake water on my skin that appeared to be tainted with dark red splotches. A peculiar rancid stench accompanied it, lingering on my nose straight from some sinister source. Unsettled, I wiped off what seemed like blood on my pants and tried to shake the feeling as inconsequential. Later that evening as night fell over the lake, I returned to my RV after a forgettable attempt at catching dinner. With only the soft hum of the RV inverter in the background and flickering shadows from dim lamplight within the vehicle, the sense of isolation overwhelmed me. Looking out through windows which now seemed like cages trapping me within them was like staring into darkness itself. Suddenly, there was a loud bang against one side of the RV followed by faint scratch marks moving seamlessly around the metal exterior. Panicking, I hastily bolted up all doors and windows, locking myself tight inside. Moments later, another noise emerged from beneath RV, like dragging chains against rocks. At this point my nerves had reached breaking point. 
The phones had zero reception, not enough to contact the entrance service gate for immediate assistance. The next morning, despite fear still nestling inside me, I decided to investigate the events that transpired on that fateful night. Stepping out of the RV, I was greeted by the aftermath of scratches on its otherwise gleaming surface. Just as I examined part of the damage, a park ranger named Lella Calloway approached and offered her assistance. A warm grin crossed her face as she reached out her hand towards me, forcing out a joke about how nature took no prisoners and made its mark regardless. I tried to laugh along with her but couldn't ignore my good feeling that something wrong was lurking beneath my laughter. After inquiring about ranger help reports or similar instances happening around the area in recent past, she denied knowing of such events and advised me to head into town to get it checked out by a mechanic. Once again alone near the lake, I reassured myself with the thought, I'm overthinking this. So after making a quick meal of canned spaghetti and an impressive three-for-one deal on soda cans, I know, never a healthy choice but couldn't complain for such camping food and wash of stress, I threw caution to the wind and headed back down to my fishing spot from yesterday. This time, however, the serene waters held traces of horror. I was standing near a small severed animal limb on the shore, most likely from an unfortunate woodland creature caught within its grasp, suddenly realizing I hadn't noticed it before. Suddenly, my vision shifted into crimson red as an imposing figure stumbled out from behind a nearby tree. Covered head to toe in blood and ragged clothes, this gaunt man stood defiantly tall while shrouded in shadows cast by thick vegetation around him. He lumbered forward steadily onto solid ground without saying a word, moving coldly like some unhuman shell of a man. I was petrified, frozen with terror as this grotesque intruder made his way towards me, his bloodshot eyes locked on mine, an unspeakable intent implied in their reddened gaze. As the blood-soaked man advanced towards me, my instincts screamed at me to flee. I stumbled backward, nearly tripping over my own feet as I moved away from him. He didn't speak didn't make any noise beyond the squelching of his bloodied footsteps. The only thought running through my mind was to escape this nightmare. My feet carried me back toward the RV, but it felt like I was moving in slow motion. With every step I took, the man seemed to be getting closer and even more menacing. His unwavering gaze seemed to go right through me, and his mangled hands reached out, his intentions obvious. As I reached the RV door, I fumbled with my keys in a desperate attempt to unlock it. My hands were shaking uncontrollably from the overwhelming fear gripping me. Once inside, I slammed the door shut, locked it, and hurriedly moved away from the windows. I knew that hiding inside wouldn't keep me safe forever. This man was relentless and determined in his pursuit. Despite my fear, calling for help was out of the question. The lack of phone reception made it impossible. Instead, I focused on finding something that could help defend myself or escape this terrifying situation. In my panic search through the RV, I came across a flare gun that belonged to my emergency kit. While it wasn't meant for self-defense and couldn't guarantee a successful outcome against my pursuer, there were no other viable options at the moment. It would have to do. Peering cautiously through one of the windows, the horror washed over me as I saw the man still approaching my RV with a disturbing resolve, moving slowly but never wavering in his pursuit. Preparing myself for what was about to happen next, I took a deep breath and opened the door abruptly, pointing the flare gun towards him. The man only noticed the flare gun a split second before I fired it. 
The intense light and heat from the flare impacted his bloodied shoulder, erupting into brilliant flames and causing him to howl in pain. The shock of the injury stopped him in his tracks, but I couldn't waste any time basking in my fleeting success. Quickly realizing another opportunity was unlikely, I bolted from the RV, running aimlessly, just wanting to put as much distance as possible between me and that grotesque figure. As I kept running through the forest, my lungs burned with the effort and my legs felt like they were made of lead. As I came to a clearing in the forest, I noticed a small wooden cabin in the distance with smoke billowing from its chimney. A beacon of hope and perhaps protection, I forced myself onward despite my exhaustion. As soon as I reached the wooden door, my knuckles wrapped on it frantically, begging for sanctuary. A grizzled man with a long beard answered the door and without hesitation let me inside. Having heard everything from my rapid and terrified explanation, he assured me that he would help keep me safe. The cabin was filled with hunting equipment, some clearly meant for self-defense. He armed himself with a shotgun while handing me a baseball bat. Together we stood guard by windows and doors, waiting for any rustling or disturbance outside, fully prepared to defend ourselves from this deranged attacker. Hours passed like eternities waiting to see if our standoff would end. Dawn slowly started to break, and with it, hope began to slowly seep into my heart. We never saw the bloody assailant again after that horrifying encounter. But even after leaving that park far behind and returning to civilization, I could never forget that terrifying figure or the haunting eyes that seemed intent on causing me harm. My new friend, the man who lived in that cabin, had saved my life at that moment when it seemed inevitable that my fate was sealed. While grateful for his assistance, I mourned those little creatures whose lives were lost due to this mysterious and brutal man's horrific desires on that trip near the lake. Despite the many unanswered questions that still linger in my mind, I'm forever grateful for my time in that cabin and the man who helped me survive what could have been my last day on earth. And while I cannot forget that blood-soaked monster of a man, I also cannot forget the strength it took to stand and face him, in that moment where all hope seemed lost. On the 14th of October, 2007, I finally moved into the small secluded cabin in rural Idaho that my uncle left me in his will. His death was both sudden and unexpected due to a freak accident involving his camper van. My name is Alexander Milburn, and I lived a fairly comfortable city life up until this point. The idea of living off the grid had never crossed my mind, but I decided to give it a chance. Maybe this change was just what I needed, or maybe I just needed a break from city life. Setting foot in the cabin for the first time, I couldn't help but notice how untouched it appeared, as if my uncle had only just left it yesterday. However, the musty smell was a clear indication that the place had been left uninhabited for far too long. I spent days cleaning and fixing up my so-called sanctuary in the woods. On October 24th, a truck driver named Frederick stopped by to drop off some supplies that I had ordered online. He told me about his job and shared an amusing story about his boss getting drenched in mud during one of their shipments due to forgetting an umbrella. We shared a laugh before he wrapped up our conversation with some unsettling news about recent disappearances in this region of Idaho. As weeks passed... I began to feel uneasy myself as I spotted something strange at the edge of the forest on multiple occasions, a large creature that eerily resembled a reptilian humanoid. It appeared to be standing on two legs and had immense strength, 
breaking tree branches with ease. Whenever it noticed me observing it, it would quickly vanish into the dense foliage. Despite my skepticism, my curiosity got the better of me one day when I decided to follow some unusual tracks I found near the river that runs behind my cabin. They were unlike anything I had ever seen before. My uneasy feeling grew more intense when I stumbled upon what seemed to be a small collection of belongings, backpacks, shoes, and torn clothing, all half-buried in the dirt. At that moment, I heard a low growl but not from a dog, a bear, or even a wolf. It was something more sinister, something I had never encountered before. I cautiously peeked out from behind a tree and saw the reptilian creature standing there, just meters away from me. Its legs were muscular and covered in scaly green skin. It also had rows of sharp spines running down its back. The creature stared at me with deep-set yellow eyes. It bared long, fawn-like teeth as it hissed in my direction. Terror washed over me as I sprinted back to my cabin at full speed, without daring to look back at the monster that now seemed to be hunting me. In the following weeks, I fortified my cabin with as much security as I could muster but still couldn't shake an unfathomable sense of dread. My attempts to call for help over the phone were futile as reception was virtually non-existent out here in the woodlands. The nights were filled with haunting sounds rustling leaves, snapping tree limbs and gut-wrenching growls. I doubted whether running away would be any use since it seemed like no matter where I went within these remote woods, the creature would find me. When my longtime friend William decided to visit me for moral support during such trying times, both relief and fear engulfed me. On November 3rd at around 8.45 p.m., we formulated a plan to escape this nightmarish situation before it got any worse. We decided to leave through an old logging trail in daylight. It led straight back into town which was our only means of reaching safety. Merciless howls echoed through the forest as we shrouded ourselves in branches and climbed up a tree to spend the night. The terrifying realization that death was near presented itself when the creature, with its scaly skin and slithering tail, prowled around the trunk of our tree. Its rancid breath filled our nostrils as it searched for us in hunger-driven desperation. We stayed motionless in the tree, praying that the creature would not discover us. Hours dragged by as we listened to the creature sniffing and clawing around the base of the tree. William whispered to me what little plan he had for our escape we would wait for dawn to break before scrambling down from our hiding spot and dashing towards the logging trail. As daylight crept over the horizon, the creature finally retreated into the dense foliage. We didn't waste a moment and cautiously descended the tree before sprinting towards the trail. Our lungs burned and our legs ached with each step we took, but fear urged us onwards. We soon reached a fork in the trail where a sign marked two destinations, one leading into town and safety, the other to an old ranger station equipped with radio communication equipment. Despite longing for town's safety, William insisted we head to the ranger station instead there. We could call for help and warn others about this horrifying creature. It felt like an eternity before we reached the ramshackle building that housed the radio equipment. We quickly barricaded ourselves inside and powered up the device. Sweating profusely under pressure, I started to transmit an urgent message detailing our location and the terror lurking in these woods. As I desperately repeated my plea for help, a malignant hiss filled our ears it came from outside of the building. The reptilian creature had found us once more. William urged me to continue my call. Meanwhile, he grabbed a length of chain and secured it across the only door leading into our makeshift fortress. Our hearts somersaulted within our chests as monstrous growls erupted outside. Seconds later, P-51 
piercing claws began tearing through the old wooden walls around us, splintering so loudly it drowned out any sound from my communications on with anyone on air. We watched helplessly as lumbers were being shredded apart as though mere paper. It dawned on me that staying here might be our doom. William seemed to share the same realization, and we decided to split up the creature could only chase one of us, thereby increasing the odds for one to survive and bring help. As the creature's powerful body finally breached the walls, roaring furiously, I bolted towards the door as William swung it open and dove in the opposite direction. The lumbering reptilian monstrosity seemed confused momentarily by our simultaneous movement, but soon directed its attention towards William's fleeing form. I ran blindly through the forest, leaving my friend behind. The screams and roars in the distance grew fainter as I neared town. I kept moving until my body refused to do so any more, stumbling upon a road where a passing motorist spotted me. The driver stopped to help, wide-eyed with shock. They called 911. The next days were a blur of questioning by local authorities and fearful whispers around town. There was no trace of William or the remains of that vicious reptilian monster found in those woods. Months later, I still have nightmares about those events and cannot rid myself of guilt over abandoning my friend. But I vowed in his memory to continue sharing our story this abhorrent creature is still out there, lurking in the shadows, waiting for its next victim. November 1986 I was hauling lumber across the dense forests of Washington State. My name's Derek, and at that time, I'd been a truck driver for nearly 12 years. On this particular job, I was tasked with transporting recently cut timber from a logging site to the outskirts of a small town miles away. Every day brought its challenges, but little did I know that this one would be unforgettable. The drive through thickets and winding roads was always intense like a roller coaster gone rogue. The sun dipped lower in the sky as evening drew nearer. Along my route, there were hardly any signals for my CB radio or cell phone, so it was just me and my trusty truck against the world. You know what they say, Daryl. I mocked myself in the mirror like it was my botched rendition of a stand-up routine. When life gives you lemons... Just bite them and pretend it doesn't hurt. As the trip wore on, I began to spot something strange in my rearview mirror. A car had been following me at a painstakingly slow distance for several miles now. It looked like an old beat-up sedan, blue paint flaking away to reveal a rusted frame underneath. There were no license plates visible on it either. Feeling uneasy but not entirely threatened yet, I kept moving forward while keeping an eye on the mysterious sedan behind me. It felt as if it were stalking me, patiently waiting for something. Soon enough, everything seemed to have escalated quickly into something out of a horror movie. My phone lost all reception again, while the temperature outside dropped significantly as if someone had forcefully slammed down on Winter's fast-forward button. This is way too isolated out here. I muttered as beads of sweat started forming on my brow despite the cold air outside. Suddenly, without warning or provocation whatsoever other than maybe it sensed my growing unease like an apex predator in its element, the sedan veered right up close behind my truck and stayed there, like a vulture ready to swoop down for the kill yet uncertain if the prey was still breathing. Holding my breath as my grip on the wheel tightened like a vice, I took in every detail of my would-be tailgater. It wasn't until a neon gas station sign appeared in the distance that I saw a figure emerge from the car's darkness. The man was gaunt and eerily tall, 
was stringy black hair that hung past his shoulders. His arms were long, and thin fingers ended with sharp, blackened nails. He had unnaturally pale skin and wore a vicious smile that showed off rows of serrated teeth that were either sharpened or mutated into that form. Now's as good a time as any. I whispered nervously as I prepared to floor it and make a run for safety. As though on cue, the car behind me revved its engine to life with menace breathed new life into its rotting shell. It was almost as if it understood my intentions entirely, as if it could smell fear oozing out of me like blood in shark-infested waters. What do you want? I screamed out the window before slamming on my accelerator pedal. In response, a high-pitched cackle akin to nails on a chalkboard echoed through the night air still pierced by biting cold. A haunting refrain sending shivers down even my spine now coaxed into feeling something akin to terror deep down in its marrow. My foot pressed down on the accelerator, the truck's engine roaring in response. The sedan followed suit, closing the distance even more quickly than before. The gas station was my only hope, so I pushed the truck to its limits, desperate to reach safety. As the glowing sign grew closer, I glanced at my phone once more, praying for a signal. No luck. I was on my own. The car was now a few feet away from the rear bumper of my truck. Panicked, I swerved into the first available turnoff just ahead of the gas station. The vehicle followed me without hesitation, practically glued to my tailgate. The road became increasingly narrower and rougher as I sped along, but the sedan continued to doggedly keep pace. In an unexpected stroke of luck, an approaching vehicle's headlights appeared ahead in the near distance. As it grew closer, it was clear that it was heading towards us at high speed as well. My mind raced for options. It was a dangerous game of chicken with no clear way out. Hey! I yelled out the window in an attempt to call their attention to our predicament. We need help. Call the police. The other driver must have noticed something amiss because they came to a screeching halt upon nearing us. I slammed on my brakes as well. Dust and gravel flew into the air as both vehicles came to a stop on opposite sides of the road. The gaunt man from the sedan climbed out menacingly, slowly making his way towards my truck. His unnerving appearance alone would make anyone think twice about offering assistance. The other driver had stepped out of their vehicle now too and quickly dialed 911 at my frantic request. Time seemed to slow down as we all stood there, myself in mortal fear. This newly arrived stranger cautiously assessing the situation, and that nightmarish man approaching while grinning his horrific grin. Not willing to wait any longer, I bolted from my truck and ran past the sedan. The gaunt man followed in pursuit, as I expected. However, he was not expecting the stranger's outstretched leg which effectively tripped him and sent him sprawling across the ground. Wasting no time, the stranger and I sprinted back to their vehicle just as we heard sirens in the distance. The unknown fiend pulled himself up but didn't give chase. Instead, he offered a guttural snarl that seemed to say we had not seen the last of him. Upon reaching safety inside the vehicle, I silently thanked my savior as we awaited the arrival of the police. As flashing lights illuminated the scene, I exchanged my story with the officers. They found nothing unusual about the sedan aside from some traces of blood and suggested it could have been a demented individual on drugs or possibly suffering from a mental breakdown. They promised to investigate further to ensure our safety, though they couldn't provide much immediate comfort in light of such terror. Grateful for having survived this harrowing ordeal, my thoughts turn to those who may not have escaped this man's clutches. 
The chilling scene I'd experienced didn't augur well for anyone who'd encountered him before me. Despite the lingering horror threatening to consume me entirely, I also felt relief knowing that we had at least one person on our side, the stranger who had intervened at just the right moment and possibly saved both our lives. In that moment of gratitude towards an unlikely guardian angel, I felt an ounce of hope that we could face whatever else life would throw our way. I just returned from a lengthy deployment, and my best friend Jake Russo had insisted on celebrating at my favorite local bar in San Diego. There was nothing quite like a cold beer after months away, and we clinked glasses in celebration. Hey Derek Torres, that's not your usual drink, my friend observed. Yeah, I chuckled. Decided to try something different this time. As we were catching up, a woman from across the room caught our attention. Her face was stricken with terror, and her hands were shaking uncontrollably. I think someone needs help, Jake whispered cautiously. People were gathering around her now, trying to figure out what was going on. Drawing on our Navy SEAL training, we cautiously approached the frantic woman. Between sobs, she managed to relay that a horrifying creature had attacked her colleagues at their secret facility just outside of town. Now at full alert, we decided to investigate further. We made our way to the facility, a hidden base concealed in the hills surrounding San Diego. As we entered the seemingly ordinary building, something felt off. There was an eerie silence engulfing us. We navigated dimly lit hallways and came across a grisly sight, torn bodies littered across the floor. The wounds were vicious and unlike anything we'd ever seen before. The air was thick with dread. The terror was palpable. It's like a slaughterhouse in here. I muttered under my breath. No kidding, Jake responded. What kind of animal could do this? We tapped our vast investigative experience and began searching for any survivors while trying to piece together what had happened at this once bustling facility. Alarmingly, all security footage had been wiped clean. Whatever was responsible for this massacre was thorough. All that remained were gnarled scraps of clothing and equipment that hinted at what might have transpired just hours before. We made a silent agreement to call for backup immediately. Jake reached for his phone and dialed the emergency line, providing the necessary details. Help is on the way, he confirmed with a grave tone. The creature responsible was still at large, and its victims deserved justice. We couldn't let it harm any more people. Suddenly, we heard a deafening roar echo down the hallway. The sound sent waves of fear through our bodies, but we knew running away would only leave others in danger. Breathing heavily, we prepared ourselves for what we might face. As we continued through the facility, with its blood-stained walls and grisly aftermath still fresh, that monstrous roar remained ever-present. It was taunting us. Rounding a corner, we finally came face to face with the elusive attacker. The creature was beyond anything we could have imagined or described. It stood nearly eight feet tall, on muscular legs with razor-sharp claws for feet. Its immense body was covered in coarse fur, and thick scales. A monstrosity of teeth protruded from its grotesque mouth, slavering saliva as it growled menacingly. But perhaps the most disturbing feature was its eyes, bloodshot orbs that sank into those present with a chilling malevolence. I froze for an instant, panic-stricken by this abomination's very existence. Jake yanked me back into motion, urging me to keep moving despite our irrational urge to stand and watch in horror. We scrambled deeper into the facility as the creature began hurtling towards us. As we fled through uncharted hallways, 
attempting to create some distance between ourselves and this nightmare-infused predator, I chanced upon a set of heavy iron doors that appeared reinforced compared to their surroundings. Jake! In here! I shouted urgently. We threw open the doors and shut them behind us as quickly as possible, listening as the creature's claws scraped across the surface just moments later. The sound was blood-curdling, but we had no choice. We set to work devising a plan. We assessed our surroundings for potential escape routes, but found none. We were in a makeshift laboratory, filled with hazardous materials and questionable experiments. As we deliberated on the plan, the creature mercilessly tried to rip the doors from their hinges, denting the metal with each violent blow. Time was running out. We heard a second, distinctive set of footsteps coming down the hall as the backup we called for finally arrived. They attempted to engage the creature, but their efforts seemed hopeless. Fire and bullets barely phased it as it tore through the reinforced crew that came to our aid. In this moment of sheer desperation, I noticed a large container of explosive material on a nearby shelf. We didn't have much choice. Igniting it could level the entire room, us along with it, though doing nothing would lead to infinite destruction in the creature's wake. Jake! We have one shot at stopping this thing. I shouted over the chaos, grabbing for detonators in our desperate bid for survival. Together, we wired the explosives and braced ourselves for impact. What happened in those next few seconds felt like hours, struggling to flee while watching flames engulf our nightmarish adversary. Inexplicably, we survived that explosion, left with memories of those lost and deepening uncertainty about what just transpired became both thankful and haunted by that narrow escape from annihilation. The mangled remains of that monstrous abomination were later recovered from the rubble by military personnel, taken away under tight security, never to be seen again. Life goes on, though our world remains forever altered by that encounter. I find solace only in knowing that we stopped the terror before it could consume more lives. I had always been skeptical of the so-called haunted office located in our small town, until that unremarkable shift at work. As small-town cop named Dean Thompson, I've seen my share of weird stuff. But today was somehow different, and not just because of the odd banter with my partner, Jake. You know what kind of seafood I really hate? Shellfish. They're so darn selfish. Jake cracked and we shared a good laugh as we sipped our coffee. But shortly after, we received an urgent call about a disturbance at the old office building off Main Street. Once there, an overwhelmed secretary explained through visible distress that she had witnessed an appalling scene, a horrifically disfigured body in one of the office rooms. Jake, check the security footage. I'm going to take a look, I instructed entering the room cautiously. The sight was nothing short of nauseating, torn limbs and blood splattered all over. As I looked closer at the bloodied mess, Jake barged and visibly bewildered. Dean, you won't believe this, but the security footage, it's gone. Puzzled and slightly worried about what we've stumbled upon, we decided to interview employees in the building. Many pointed to a disgruntled employee named Walt who was recently fired and had been acting suspiciously ever since. I saw him in the break room earlier today. He was laughing to himself, said Lizzie, a part-time receptionist. Another employee named Charles jumped in. Yeah, he left his locker open yesterday. There was this terrifying hunting knife in there. As we canvassed the area for any signs of this mysterious Walt character, our sense of unease grew by the minute, especially after hearing sounds from an untouched dark corner of the building similar to hushed whispers joined by sinister laughter. 
The hairs on my neck stood up as Jake whispered beside me, his voice quivering. Dean, it's like all logic and reason has been thrown out the window. Determined to uncover the truth, we approached the eerie spot when announced our presence. Walt, if you're in there, let us help you. To our horror, a figure emerged from the darkness with a chilling grin. We didn't see his face until it was too late. The figure revealed himself to be Walt. His crazed eyes widened with a hint of satisfaction from our horrified expressions. In his hand, he gripped the hunting knife that Charles had mentioned earlier. We knew we couldn't take him on without risking our lives or further escalating the situation, so I opted to call for backup. While holding his gaze, I spoke calmly into my radio. This is Dean, requesting backup at the old office building off Main Street. We have an extremely dangerous suspect in possession of a deadly weapon. Walt's grip tightened around the knife as he realized what I had just done. He lunged towards me, but Jake tackled him to the ground just in time. The two struggled while I attempted to restrain Walt without getting sliced by the razor-sharp blade. Our backup arrived within minutes, storming into the building with weapons raised and ready to apprehend the deranged criminal. More officers rushed in to help subdue Walt, who thrashed violently. Despite his furious resistance, we managed to pin him down and cuff his hands behind his back. As we escorted him out of the building and into a waiting patrol car, the employees who had been anxiously observing from a safe distance breathed sighs of relief. One officer stayed behind to take statements from everyone as they shakily recounted their experiences with Walt leading up to this point. Later that evening, at the station, we learned more about Walt's background and possible motives for his horrific actions. Apparently, he had suffered from severe mental health issues for years and recently stopped taking his medication. Being fired from his job seemed to be the tipping point that sent him spiraling out of control. Though it didn't excuse his actions, we now understood that there were deeper forces at play than simply anger over losing his job. Our focus would shift towards making sure Walt received proper help and treatment for his mental health, while also ensuring he faced appropriate legal consequences for the gruesome scene he left behind. The unfortunate victim whose body we discovered earlier turned out to be another employee named James who had been reported missing just the day prior. As news of Walt's arrest spread, the people who knew both him and James grappled with a mix of shock, grief, and relief. As for Jake and me, we couldn't shake that haunting image of Walt emerging from the shadows, that twisted grin across his face. Even though we had taken him into custody and prevented him from causing more harm, I couldn't help but feel sorrow not only for James but also for Walt, someone whose life had gone terribly awry due to untreated mental illness. In the following days, life began to return to some semblance of normalcy for those involved. Employees at the old office building tried to move on, knowing that the danger was now behind bars. Although we continued working our usual patrols and investigations, Jake and I were often reminded of Walt's case whenever we encountered individuals battling their own demons. It served as a sobering reminder that under certain circumstances, anyone could fall victim to their own darkness. For the most part, this realization strengthened our resolve as police officers to help those in need and ensure that they would receive the support necessary to overcome their challenges before they potentially reached a breaking point like Walt. The trusty radio at my side now held deeper meaning. Not only was it a way for us to call for help when facing danger alone, but also a symbol of our duty to assist others in their moments of vulnerability. The world may never be free of shadows or atrocities, but we would always be there as an anchor within the storm. My shift had just started, and I found myself staring at the still-empty coffee cup on my desk. I'm Officer Pete Callahan 
and I'd been patrolling this small town for over twenty years. My life hadn't been full of excitement or thrilling incidents. Working in this sleepy town was more about lost pets and parking violations than anything else. Little did I know that was all about to change. As a cop in Inverness, Michigan, a sense of humor is essential, especially on those slower days. People here laugh a lot. It's just our way to cope with the tedious routine. You know why there aren't many hide-and-seek tournaments around here? My partner Mitch said as he walked into our shared office. Because good luck hiding when everyone knows everybody. We both chuckled at this small-town joke. Everything changed that day when we received a call from the local gas station attendant. His voice trembled as he reported witnessing something horrifying behind the building, something that caused him to vomit on his shoes. We rushed to the scene, the unsettling anxiety creeping up on us as we got closer. A deep sense of dread weighed us down with each step we took past the gas station's rear entrance. When we reached the grisly scene behind the pump area, we couldn't believe our eyes. Several cats were lying there in shreds, their remains flung across the rusty dumpster like confetti. Their unnerving little screams still echoed through my memory as Mitch and I stared, speechless. As a cop and animal lover, I couldn't shake the nausea induced by this sickening sight. The perpetrator had bound them together with duct tape before inflicting such deplorable cruelty on these helpless creatures. Gathering ourselves together, Mitch and I began asking around for witnesses or possible leads. The gas station cameras had malfunctioned that night, so surveillance footage wouldn't be of any help. We canvassed the neighborhood, but it seemed as if everyone in town was just as clueless or horrified as we were. Days went by, and the case remained unsolved. But the feeling that something sinister lurked just beneath the surface of our peaceful town remained unsettlingly present. Then, one evening, we received another call. The local butcher had found the carcass of an animal hanging outside his shop. The scene was dreadfully similar to what we'd seen at the gas station. This time, though, a message was scrawled on a filthy scrap of cloth left by whoever had committed this heinous act. Sorry for the mess. I looked at Mitch, and we both knew we had to do something about this situation. We weren't investigators, but as protectors of this town, we couldn't ignore these gruesome actions any longer. Another call came just a few days later from a family whose dog had been found mutilated in their backyard. They were devastated, and the agonizing cries of their children haunted us. The perpetrator had left another note. Another mess. At a meeting with our fellow officers, we decided to up the police patrol and keep a watchful eye around the town. If this monster was still out there, he or she wouldn't go unnoticed again. We realized that calling for help from other towns might scare our people even more, but it was clear that we were dealing with someone who enjoyed inflicting pain on animals and creating chaos. Despite the increased patrols, the attacks continued, each time more brutal than before. Chickens were massacred in a barn, a goat's organs left strewn across a farmer's porch. Incidents like this had our town panicking, and my colleagues and I grew increasingly tense. One dreary morning, our worst fears were confirmed as the violence escalated into human territory. A local teenager was attacked while walking home from school and barely managed to elude his assailant. He described a man with long unkempt hair and wild eyes, wearing an old hooded sweatshirt stained with what looked like blood. Our town lived in terror as the search for the man responsible intensified. Then one evening while patrolling near the edge of town, Mitch and I spotted what appeared to be an abandoned cabin. Faint light glimmered from within. Hesitating for just a moment, we radioed for backup knowing that if the perpetrator was inside, confronting him might not end well for us. Proceeding cautiously toward the cabin door, we braced ourselves for what we might find inside. Upon entering the foul-smelling space, 
we saw a man hunched over a desk scribbling on a dirty piece of cloth. The walls were covered in newspaper clippings about the attacks and disturbing drawings of animals. He didn't notice us as we moved in. Without warning, the man leaped up and charged at us after finally realizing our presence in his hideout. Unarmed, all he could do was lash out with his fists and sharp, ragged nails, aiming to claw at our faces while his wild eyes stared straight through us. While the man had size and strength on his side, we managed to dodge his blows and tackle him to the ground. Mitch held him down tightly until backup arrived moments later. With the murderer in custody, we took a moment to catch our breaths as the adrenaline rush dissipated. Looking around at this horrifying cabin filled with his twisted mementos, it felt like a nightmare come to life. As word spread that the attacker had been caught, our town began to heal slowly, haunted by the memory of those terrible days. Grief for the animals lost and fear for those who survived will always linger. It's a burden that touches everyone here. No one will forget how close we came to losing everything, but perhaps now we can find some semblance of peace. In time, we might regain the small-town atmosphere where everyone knows everybody, a place where jokes about hiding are still laughed at warmly. As for me and Mitch, our job continues, protecting our town and ensuring that evil like this never invades our home again.